Good Friday evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mo de Frank Stadium for the District 1 6A football championship featuring the Coatesville Red Raiders and your Garnet Valley Jaguars kickoff coming up at 7 o'clock p.m., 20 minutes from just now. Uh, Greg and I are uh, in the booth along with our production crew from the Sports Fan Base Network. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about them later, but as I mentioned, as we have been doing weekly, uh, Greg and I had a chance to catch up with Coach Ricky uh, before the game and wanted to bring you that interview right now. So let's roll that. Hello and welcome to week four of the District 1 playoffs. We're here again with Coach Mike Ricky from Garner Valley. Coach, congratulations on the win last week against Quakertown in round three. And obviously we're on to Coatesville, but if you want to talk a little bit about that that round three victory last week and some of the adversity you guys faced early on. Yeah, well, that was a, first of all, it was a great high school football game. Uh, Quakertown was everything we thought they were going to be. We knew they were very explosive on offense. Their quarterback, their running backs, their split end uh, were really good. Their line was big and strong and mobile. So Quakertown was, was exactly what we thought they were going to be. They were uh, very well coached, disciplined. They they really um, went to their strengths. You know, we did shut down their running game. I think they only had 54 yards rushing total, uh, which forced them to throw the ball just about 40 times. And number 87 seemed to have 70 catches. Um, but he, they uh, they did a really good job with that. The thing that, that I really liked in the game, uh, we, we had things go against us in the first half. We had a couple miscommunications, it, it just things that didn't go our way. And we were down at halftime. Uh, I made a bad call. I, I called that hook and ladder uh, right before halftime. I thought we could get that. Uh, we execute that so well at practice. Um, Coach Boyd didn't want to run it because of exactly what happened. But um, anyway, with all that that happened, the way we came out at halftime, we scored 22 points in the third quarter. Uh, we, we record three interceptions. I, I just can't say enough for the way they bounce back and uh, the way they handle themselves. Again, it was a halftime of there's no yelling or screaming or hollering. It was just a, hey, let's get it figured out and let's move on. And that's exactly what they did. Coach, yeah. talk about what happens. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Just talk about what happens at halftime. It's just there, there's been a, um, you know, small handful of games where, where, where you, what you described has happened over the course of the season. And and it just seems like uh, even with that hiccup early in the second half last week, that Garnet Valley and that uh, the team in general just comes out and and uh, and really dominates the second half of football this season. Yeah, all, I'm all sure really, that's no surprise, right? Well, all we really do at halftime is refocus on what we're trying to do. You know, our mantra of do what you're supposed to do so many times and sometimes like that ball in the third quarter, it was not an onsides kick that they tried. It just was a short, hard ground ball that took a funky bounce and they got it. Sometimes that happens. And sometimes the other teams make plays and, and that's okay. And that's what we tell them. Hey, sometimes they're going to make plays. We get them these plays and now we're in this situation and we're still very much in this game. Um, it, we don't have to make, we haven't had to make any mammoth adjustments just we look to see what we like on offense, where we think we can exploit, get a better feel for uh, how our linemen, what they see and what Max sees. And then we just try and go out and take advantage of that. And defensively, we, we didn't change one thing. We might have changed a little bit. Uh, we might have mixed our coverage up a little bit more, but uh, mostly doing the same thing that we did before. Yeah, Coach, um, briefly, there was a tweet the other day from Nate Heckenberger, who covers, you know, high school sports for the Daily Local in <laughs> County, um, put it out there about Garnet Valley and Coatesville being familiar with each other, this being the fourth time in five years, that the two teams are the two winningest teams in 6A in District 1, with Coatesville being 64 and 10, I think, since the beginning of the 16 season, and Garnet Valley 61 and 11, but it's certainly familiar foes for both teams. So, you know, from, from the standpoint of seeing the same team again and in virtually the same spot, talk a little bit about how Garner Valley prepares to, you know, play somebody that they've seen so frequently. Well, he, he's absolutely right. We know each other intimately. Uh, each of the four games or the three games that we've had, this being the fourth, I think um, have been 
like the first game we played in 2017 for the um, District One Championship was at Garnet Valley. It was a, a nail biter. It was a great high school football game. It could have gone either way. Um, they won in the last play of the game or last minutes of the game. The year in 2018, you know, we didn't have things go our way. They won 42 to seven, but it, it should probably not have been a score like that. That was, I think, the most loaded Coatesville team that, that, that they had. And then uh, in 2019, it was another great game at Garnet Valley. I felt like, honestly, they were better than we were at every position in, in 2019. They had, and, and they're very well coached. This is a well coached uh, football team. Uh, I think this year, it shapes up a little bit differently. I don't think they're better than we are at every position. I think, um, you know, I think it's a, a, in terms of talent, it's a much more evenly matched game than it has been in the past. Um, in terms of preparation, you know, we do exactly the same thing that we do every week. We look at what Coatesville does, you know, with, with film and, uh, you know, we we're able to break so many things down, different tendencies, different things that they like to do. We have a real understanding of what they're trying to do. Uh, defensively, they have defended us differently than they have every other team that they played each time that we play them. And um, so we're expecting more of the same with that. So if they don't, if, if they, if they defend us the way that they did in 2018 and 2019, you know, we're, we're prepared for that. If they defend us the way that they have most of their games this year, we're prepared for that. So to me, it's just a matter of going out and execute and see what they're going to do and then react accordingly. Um, I mentioned it briefly. One of the benefits of making it as far as Garner Valley has made it, which is you're still playing on past Thanksgiving, is the tradition of the Thursday morning practice that you still have as you know Garner Valley traditionally does not play a Thanksgiving Day game like a lot of local schools do so the opportunity to practice on Thanksgiving means that you're still alive in the playoffs um, and that was a really cool scene yesterday as all of them have been to so just talk about how meaningful it is to be able to have the families and the alumni and all that go on yesterday yeah well you're exactly right playing on uh, the day after Thanksgiving means you're still deep in the playoffs and still alive so way back in 2006 the first time that we had that experience we decided that, you know, our theme is oneness. Our philosophy is built around the concept of oneness. Thanksgiving, what a perfect time to involve the family, the alumni, the community. So way back then we had a practice and we invited everybody, parents, families, community members, alumni to come out and join us at eight o'clock on Thanksgiving morning. We serve coffee, donuts, hot chocolate, pretzels. Uh, and it's just a kind of a festive atmosphere. It's a way for everybody to get together before the day kicks off to enjoy some camaraderie, uh, to relax a little bit, to have some fun. And uh, it, was, it was a big hit in 2006. And I think this year was the sixth time that we've participated in something like that. The turnout yesterday was spectacular. We had alumni, Jesse Cheney was there from 1967. Uh, he was the oldest alumni that I saw. Uh, there could have been somebody else, but he was the, the oldest one I saw. John Kelly from 1975 was there. Steve Conrad from uh, the, the later 70s. Uh, Jerry Montella was there. Uh, we had a whole slew of guys from more recent teams that were there. And it was just, it was fun. It was um, exactly what I hoped that day would be. There was a number of families that came out. They, like everybody's excited for the game. We we know Coatesville is a great team. We we know it's going to be a great game, and we're just excited for the chance to compete and do it together. Yeah, I, I was uh, happy to be there as, as well and got to talk to some of those folks. And um, you know, it was a real real buzz of uh, of optimism um, around that, and and uh, a lot of talk about how how. Uh, how very good, if not great, that this uh, this team has been all year, and and I totally agree with you. I think I think you match up very well with uh, with this Coatesville team this year. And as Mike Missinelli might say, it's a a triple revenge home <laughs> home game, and then it's a uh, um, so I think uh, you know looking forward looking forward to a great one and uh, and a, and another fine performance and. And again, you know, we'd be remiss um, here. I know you don't want to hear it anymore, but uh, your last night uh, at the Mo. Hopefully, we got a couple more weeks left in us. But uh, um, 
any way this this goes, it's uh, it's going to be your your last walk up there with these guys, and uh, just spend a minute talking about what that's going to be like for you. Well, you know, um, first of all, we're we're not going to have Sean Gallagher in this game. Um, Sean hurt his knee and uh, unfortunately will not be able to play. He will be our honorary captain tonight. And, you know, we were kind of saving him for this game to, to be our honorary captain because he's such a great kid. And the great irony is he's not going to be able to play in it. Uh, the kids were visibly moved when we found out that he couldn't play and, and Sean was beside himself. He wants so desperately to be out there. Um, so this is going to be, uh, I know those guys are pulling together to, and Jack Westberg is more than ready to go to, to be his backup. But, uh, you know, our guys are ready to go with that. As far as the last game, I, this morning I woke up and I had a number of texts uh, from people sending me. Uh, Tom Link had posted something on Facebook. I guess people are aware that I'm not on Facebook. Um, and uh, Chris Massey, a former student who writes for the Sun Gazette out in the Williamsport area, had written a really nice article and you know I, you're so much in game mode and get ready to play mode but the reality is I know it's the last game that, that I'm going to coach at the Mo and when, when I read stuff like that and it, it does I'm an emotional passionate guy it, it I got very emotional this morning uh, reading that I think tonight during the game, I don't think I will be as emotional before the game uh, because, you know, our, our whole focus is going to be on our guys and making sure that they're ready. This I would never want to do anything to take anything away from this group and all that they are and all that they stand for. Um, and this is this is their night, and they've worked really hard for that. Uh, Coach Ann White made a great pump-up video. Um, I think Coach Ann helped a little bit um, with that. But it was uh, – you know, the, when you watch those guys in the weight room and watch them pull for one of the, the passion District and the excitement and the trust and the love is, it's is so tangible. Final. Yeah, because we're down to the and, final eight um, state. You know, that's where our emphasis will be tonight. Yeah, the District 1 championship. All right. kind of Good luck. Hopefully we have one of these next week. Yeah, yeah. I hope so too. Thank you. Plan. All right. Go, Go Jags. Jags. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, welcome back, everybody. As the Jags get ready to take the field on this 37-degree uh, night with a steady 14-mile-an-hour wind blowing straight uh, from a northwesterly direction across this uh, this field. It's going to feel like it's in the 20s tonight, but uh, a lot of electricity in the air for this one. Greg? Yeah, well, you mentioned... 14 mile an hour steady wind. I was down on the field for about 35 minutes in pregame watching the kickers and punters from both teams and the returners actually trying to judge the wind. It certainly seems like more than 14 miles per hour. It's that fairly normal, steady, left to right wind here at Garner Valley coming off the top hill, going from the snack bar end down to the scoreboard end. But it'll be interesting to see what the two teams try and do, kicking and punting, because um, this wind like this blowing straight down the field will make a mess of the best kicking game plan. We've seen that play out over the years. So, so yeah, the uh, Coatesville Red Raiders come in here carrying a record of 12-1. Uh, and 1. The Jags, of course, 13-0 and 0 off the strength of a big victory last week against uh, Quakertown. Uh, and this is a very familiar opponent, as you heard uh, the coach talk about earlier in the pregame. These uh, Coatesville Red Raiders have not lost to uh, the Jaguars in, uh, in three three visits over the last four years. And uh, this will be the fourth and, uh, and hoping for a different outcome there. They're uh, a very talented team, a very well-coached team, uh, a fast team. But uh, you could say the very same thing about the, the Jaguars. I think we have a very evenly matched uh, game tonight. And uh, we're looking forward to... Uh, to some fireworks and hopefully a different outcome than we've seen the last couple of years. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier in our interview with Coach Ricky, uh, Nate Heckenberger from the Daily Local News. Throughout the week, sent out some tweets just with some updates about the game, the matchups, the three previous matchups. Um, since the beginning of the 2016 season, so the last five seasons now, 
Coatesville is the winningest team in District 1, 6A, and Garnet Valley is second. Coatesville has a record of 64-10. and 10. Since then, Garnet Valley 61-11. and 11. In the playoffs, Coatesville now has a 16-3 and 3 record, Garnet Valley 13-4. and 4. This is the fourth District 1 championship appearance for the Coatesville Red Raiders and the third for the GV Jags. So they clearly are the two best teams, 6A in District 1 over that span, and certainly were this year. Um, came into the, the District 1 tournament seeded first and third overall, respectively. Garnet Valley at 10-0. and 0. Coatesville with 9-1 and 1 with that lone loss coming back on September 10th to William Penn from out in central Pennsylvania. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're two very good football teams. They're two very talented football teams. They have um, coaching staffs that, that do a really good job of picking on the, the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of their opponent. And they exploit that regularly, um, even in big games. You saw it throughout the playoffs. You know, Garner Valley scored 58 points um, after that 22-point outburst to start the second half last week against Quakertown, and and Coatesville put up 50 on Ridley. So, and and they were two quality opponents in Quakertown and Ridley. So, as it plays out, these are the two best teams, and as it should be for a District One championship. Yeah, it seems like it took forever for this moment to get here, but we're just a few minutes away from kickoff. And uh, the, the captains are coming to the center of the field for the coin toss representing uh, Coatesville is number 17, R.J. Rickaball, number 10, Nolan O'Hara, number one, Tommy Ortega, and number eight is uh, LeBron Bessick. For the Jaguars, of course, is uh, Shane Reynolds and C.J. Wood out there with tonight's honorary captain, number 35, Sean Gallagher, Nolan Brennan, and... Uh, and Zach Busenkill, or Max Busenkill are on the, uh, the hash. This is, of course, a ceremonial coin toss, and we're not mind readers here, but you're going to see that uh, Coatesville wins the toss, and they will defer. The Jaguars will defend the east end zone, so to the right of your screen, and they will go directly into the teeth of this wind here for the first quarter of this game. And we will have the national anthem and we'll be back with the kickoff. Shout out to a couple of our friends broadcasting the game tonight for those who couldn't be here in a very crowded Moda Frank Stadium, but uh, the Concordville Inn in, on Route 1 in Glen Mills tuned in, watching and listening this evening. Thank Alex Hyonis and uh, Steve Angeline, always good friends to the Garnet Valley community and right up the street at uh, Ashley's, uh, Bill and Tracy Moskowitz. Uh, Doing the same thing up there, showing uh, showing the game for those folks who uh, couldn't brave the cold this evening, Greg. Yeah, it's cold out there, <laughs> and and right out of the gate, we're going to see Coatesville. As we mentioned, they uh, they won the coin toss and deferred, and they're kicking off 
from left to right, so they'll be kicking with the wind. And so the I expect you'll see the Garnet Valley returners way back deep, probably closest to the goal line. And then when you see them going the other way, you'll probably see them up at about the 25. So you see right off right off the opening kick here what happens with this wind. Doing the kicking is Nolan O'Hara. And he kicks this one deep and and the Jags let it go over their head into the end zone and they'll start at their own 20. That was Jack Westberg was the uh, the deep man there. Chooses to let it go over. And of course, as coach mentioned there tonight, although he's dressed, uh, Sean Gallagher not in the lineup tonight and uh, Jack Westberg will start at that uh, they call it the sniffer position, Greg? Yeah, it's our inside slot back. Yeah. Referred to as the sniffer in the GV offense. Luke Lassick and Ryan Saunders split either way. And this give goes right to Westberg, and he's around the corner for a decent gain of about five or six. It'll go right to him <laughs> there on the first play of the game. And we'll call it a pickup a seven. Yeah, second and a second and, and a long three. Yeah, so the Jags going into that wind, run that jet sweep and put themselves in, you know, a manageable second and short, which I'm sure going into the wind, both teams are gonna want to run the ball and control clock. This give goes to Reynolds, and he's bottled up pretty quickly by the middle of that. Coatesville defense. We'll call it looks like no no maybe just a little bit. Call it third and third and a long two. And you know, Jaguars coming out. Obviously you want to go down and score, but for sure you want to pick up a first down or two just to get yourself some better field position in the event you do have to punt. Saunders split to the top of your screen. Two tight ends. And here's the option play to the left side. Oh, it picks up a great block by Westberg. And this is Reynolds around the corner. 50, 40, 30, 20, one man to beat. 10, five, and he's dragged down inside the five yard line at about the two. Tremendous speed there by LeBron Bessick to catch up to Reynolds and save the touchdown. But here's the, here's the replay. We talked about Jack Westberg being in there for the injured Gallagher. And he has a tremendous block on the yeah. edge there to seal that edge and get Reynolds outside. And then Shane did the rest. He took off. Listen, there aren't many people that are going to outrun Bessick, probably in the entire state. <laughs> right. He's so a standout track star at Coatesville in addition to being a... Jags first and goal. And this is Reynolds. He's in for the touchdown. So with 10 minutes and 13 seconds left to go in the first quarter the Jags go 80 yards here's the replay of the touchdown that's just the big boys big boys blocking up front yep. heavy formation and the guys on the left Brennan Mahoney do a nice job they... Zach Libertor on to attempt the extra point Work. Up, Garner Valley's missing a wing. You see Libertor. And C.J. Wood racing out there. There's still 10 seconds left on the play clock. Snap down. Kick is up. Kick is good. One for one. Jaguars lead seven to nothing. So that was about a four plays and uh, yeah, four 80 plays. yards covered and the Jags go up early yeah and it, you know we, going into that wind we certainly talked about not wanting to punt well when you when you go 80 yards on four plays all running the ball you don't have to worry about punting now we'll get to see what they try and do kicking into this wind we saw that opening kickoff by 
the Coatesville place kicker wasn't particularly deep, but it just carried. So we'll see if the Jags try and do something different here. Just trying to keep the ball out of the wind. Interesting. See, Coatesville obviously wants the ball in the hands of Bessick. They have him standing in the middle of the field back on the 15-yard <laughs> line to try and not let Garnet Valley kick away from him. So it'll be an interesting cat and mouse game, see what the Jags do here to not let Bessick touch the ball. Oh, this is just a, a pop-up. Oh, and football. it's fielded and it's uh, muffed, but uh, looks like it's covered by Coatesville. So almost a uh, big mistake by Coatesville but they are fortunate to cover it up and they will start their first drive from their own 34 yard line. And of course their uh, quarterback, the junior, Harry Soucy, also a threat with his legs and their number one receiver split to the bottom of our screen here is Tommy Ortega, the Bakes backs, Ashawn Wesley, this give goes looking for room around the outside, and they find some. Good play just coming around the edge, number eight, Bessick. A jet sweep motion there again. Good enough for the first down inside Jaguar territory. Yeah, and you see Saunders comes up. He thinks he's got an angle on him. I just, the Jags haven't seen anybody with the speed that Bessick has, so it'll be interesting to see them react to his speed. You know, Coachville smartly gets him the ball in jet motion and just gets him on the edge the same as Reynolds going the other way. This time, Susie keeps it himself and he picks up another six or seven around the outside just a fake handoff up the middle and design keeper for him, I believe, working the edges. I was going to mention there, you know, if you watched anything from film last week uh, from Quakertown. Garnet Valley really did shut their their off their uh, their running game down, but where they had moderate success was was pushing the edges early. And, and so, in a second and short situation you likely see Coachville take a shot here. You see they go empty. And Susie throws, he's got a completion out on the left side. Tackled immediately is number six, Dwayne Molina. But not before Coatesville moves the chains. Tackle on the play by Ryan Saunders. Empty again. This time, Susie takes it himself, and he's around the edge, and he's got another first down for Coatesville. Tough to bring down the 5'11", 190-pound junior. Yeah, the, the previous three times that the Jags played Coatesville, obviously it was Ricky Ortega, Coach Ortega's son, who was the quarterback started for all four years at Coatesville and is now playing it collegiately at Villanova and, and Susie's been the guy since Ortega left. And this is Susie again and this time he's hit. Hit early in the hole. Joe Halloran, number 14 middle linebacker came flying up there and made that hit early so it'll be second and nine for Coatesville at the Garnet Valley 21 yard line. The skid goes around the edge. This is number four this time, Ashawn Wesley, and he's close to the, gets the first down, but not the touchdown. He's pushed out of bounds at the one-yard line. So, Coatesville knocking on the door here at, on Garner Valley. Yeah, it's twice now you've seen Garner Valley defensive backs come up in in pursuit, angle pursuit, and just misjudge the speed. Yeah. And 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 not get that outside shoulder leverage and and 
let the Coatesville running backs get to the sideline and get, get upfield. Dags will certainly have to adjust on that. Oh, this give goes up the middle to Wesley, and he's in for the touchdown. So just like that, now with 8.34 left in the first quarter, Coatesville within an extra point of tying this one up. About three minutes and 26 seconds into the game, it's about <laughs> to be 14, or 7-7, seven, seven, 14 total points. Everybody who took the overs happy. <laughs> Ortega the holder. O'Hara the kicker. It is up and it's good. Tie ball game. That was a 65 yard drive by Susie and the Coatesville Red Raiders to even this one up. Quick shout out to some of our loyal listeners. Got the Patterson and Murphy families together for Thanksgiving. They're of all places, they're on Garnet Lake in Johnsburg, New York. Hoping that's a good omen. Uh, General Widely, Steve and Andy Romito, Don Mink, listening, Ruth Ann Wenner, Melissa Roach, Judd Walton, who may be in the house tonight. Bids, Mr. DeFrank, Mr. Demling. There's a whole stable of remote shout outs that we've given of which a lot of them are around Glen Mills and Garner Valley for the Thanksgiving holiday weekend so and this kick too will sail through the end zone and Jags will put it in play at the 20 I would think that unless teams deliberately try not to kick the ball in the end zone that every ball going towards the scoreboard and it's <laughs> going to be a touchback yeah, that flag is not showing any signs of uh, slowing down. It's whipping pretty consistently there. So the second drive for Garnet Valley will start where their first drive did, right at the 20-yard line. There's a pitch out to Saunders around the right side where he is pursued quickly and tackled for a short gain of about two, call it second and eight. Good size across the line there for Coatesville. 5'11", 260 pound Francisco Hall is number two. Chase Scott, number three, six foot 230. And number 43, 6'3", 230, Takaya. Lynch. Yeah, that, that play with that lot that play was made by that linebacker number 34, Barthmeyer. He he got out there and got to Saunders' feet before he could even get himself turned up field. Well, here's a handoff inside to Reynolds. He picks up uh, another three or four here. Call it three. Third and five for the Jags. Clock now at 739 to go in the first quarter. Luke Lassick checking in. Will Resneski, the tight end, comes out. Jack Westberg split to the bottom of your screen. And Buzenkill looks to throw, but it's a draw. Oh, and he loses the football. Coatesville thinks they have it. And they do. So Buzenkill looked like he had a good gainer coming, but he gets stripped from behind. loses the football and it's covered by Coatesville. So Jags make the first error of the evening here. I I think they said Garnet Valley ended up with the ball. It's just fourth down. I oh. think this is just a punt. Hey, you can watch just the reaction of the officials and the team's <laughs> not sure. Yeah, Coatesville set back to punt. Garnet Valley's got their punt unit on the yeah. field. Check that. I saw. I thought I saw two referees. Actually, Garner Valley's got their offense still on the field on fourth and five. 
I'd look for the uh, interesting. Look for a hard count in the timeout. And timeout by Coatesville. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I'm not the only one confused out here. That uh, I think everybody in the stadium was confused. The one official initially signaled Coatesville ball, and then the other two looked like they came in and went, "No, no, no, no." The Garner Valley guys got it. Yeah. So. So the Jags at their own 25, uh, Coatesville calling timeout. They're still got the offense out there. This is uh, looks as though they're going to go for it unless they have a uh, a regular offense punt team. Reynolds can punt, right? Uh, he can. I, the only thing I'll say is this may be based more on those weather conditions that we've talked about as much as we have, oh, right. more so than field position or anything else. I. Yeah, you don't, <laughs> don't have too many prospects if you, if you, if you have kicking a, into this win. Right, if you right? punt a ball that only goes 12 or 15 yards, you're giving them the ball inside the 40 anyway, so you might as well try and go for it, yeah. pick up the five, and keep moving the sticks. I I, I think it's based on weather conditions, not so much That's an confidence out, in picking up the five yards. Outstanding point. And they go option to Reynolds around the outside. He's got the first down and more. He's across the 35, almost to the 40, and that'll move the chains for Garnet Valley. Huge play on fourth down by the Jaguars. Another good block by Westberg. Great decision by Coach Ricky. Great call by head offensive coordinator Rich Boyd. Jags move the sticks and now have it out at about a 37-yard line. First and 10 at the Jaguar 37. Reynolds, the lone setback. And this will go to Westberg around the edge. He picks up a block from Reynolds, but is tackled after a gain of three. Second down and seven for the Jaguars. We talked two weeks ago when, the, when Garner Valley played CB West, and the Bucks came down here in that round two game. We talked in the pregame about it. Coach Ricky talked about it, and we saw it throughout the broadcast how much team speed CB West had laterally sideline to sideline. And Coatesville's just as quick as that defense is. Their front seven can move side to side. This give goes to Reynolds, and he picks up three tough yards. Third and four for the Jaguars. 5.44 left to go in the first quarter. And you, you wonder if from a play calling standpoint, the Garner Valley offense is looking at this as a, a two plays to pick up four yards. They went for yeah. it when it was fourth and five from their own 25, so I think sure. they won't likely go for two here unless they lose yardage. But now Haller in the tight end split to the bottom of your screen. And this give goes to Westberg around the end, and he is stopped short of the first down. He picked up about a yard. Yep, yeah, maybe one or two here. Yep, yeah, just a yard. So fourth and fourth and three, fourth and four. And the Jags, again, not hesitating here. They're going to go for it into the wind. Lassick and Wetzberg to the bottom of your screen. It's like Saunders up top. This give goes to Reynolds, and he's got the first down across the 50-yard line into Coatesville territory, down to the Coatesville 45. Moves the chains for the Jaguars. And another key fourth down conversion for Garnet Valley, Greg. Yeah, and I, I'd be surprised that they don't, I mean, certainly now that they're across midfield, I would think that it's going to be go for it on four down territory throughout this drive. I, in this direction into the wind for sure, I would think that they would take advantage of their ability to run the ball the way they have and keep the sticks moving. Oh, that was a little confusion there. A handoff to Reynolds, but there was a lot of traffic. And yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if the exchange was even cleaner. I don't know that it was going anywhere. There was a lot of a lot of bodies in the middle right there. Give a shout out to all of the Haggerties and Ramitos that are down watching in Ocean View, Delaware. Just got a check in from them, showing me that they're watching on the TVs down there. <laughs> This is a pitch out to the outside, and this time 
Reynolds is uh, swallowed up after a short gain. Checchio checks in for Reynolds. And I think had a maybe an equipment problem with a shoe or something. So third and long for the Jags. And this is Checchio up the middle, fighting for close to four yards. It's going to be fourth and six for the Jags. <laughs> Somebody tried to throw some, something over in the wind, took it. Reynolds checks back in, Checchio out. Rezneski in, Lasik out. So this is the third straight, fourth down. The Jaguars have faced. They're perfect so far. Oh, and a whistle blows. Oh, Coatesville uses Coatesville their second timeout. uses, yeah, second timeout of the half for Coatesville. They must have seen something there. Use the timeout. I just got a check in from former kicker, safety, split end, and now Air Force goalie Jason Rose. Ah. He's watching out in Colorado. Could not get home for the Thanksgiving holiday. But he's watching on his TV from out in the western half of the United States. Want to quickly talk about a player from the Jags who is not here tonight. Uh, Garnet Valley running back, fullback Jason Bernard had surgery on his foot earlier this week and is home watching as he's affectionately known by his teammates bus was not able to be here if he could he'd be here but he sent a note to all his teammates earlier today wishing them the best and telling them to go get it done bus your teammates got your back buddy and here we go it's a quick swing screen to Westberg, but he is tackled right away. It's there if the block's there. Yeah. Whoever yeah. the defender is on the D-line gets off the block. Yeah. You see a couple of the Garner Valley linemen, Austin Sorgan Connich is out there, and he just gets, yeah, he just gets underneath the block. Yep. Yeah. He read it qu quicker than the block could get set up, and he comes through and makes the tackle short of the sticks. So with two minutes and 13 seconds left to go in the quarter, Coatesville takes over at their own 42 yard line. Susie looking to throw and he's going to go deep. He's got a guy across the middle but off the tips of his fingers. Man, yeah. can he fly. <laughs> yeah, that one intended for LeBron Bessick. LeBron Bessick again. He can fly. It's one thing to watch him on film. Another thing to see him out here. Yeah, he was running with the wind. <laughs> but he can move. Jet motion. This is Susie keeping it himself. He's hit and hit hard early, I think, by Nolan Brennan. Sliding down from that nose tackle position. Big play for both teams. Yep. Garner Valley, you know, Coatesville got their first stop on that last possession. You Garner Valley try and keep them here in midfield. Sh their side of midfield, maybe make it a difficult decision, force them into a punt. And they're bringing some pressure. Oh, <laughs> and Susie getting away. Oh! Intercepted? Yes. Interception, Garnet Valley, huge. Max Busenkill after on the tip drill. I, I think Adozi Okolo gets his hand on the ball. He does, yeah. And tips it downfield to Busenkill. Huh? Yep. Okolo with the hand. 
misdirects the ball and Busenkill with a great snag there. Better yet, you don't even have to have him punt in with the win. You get a pick and now you got the ball at your own 38 yard line, Pat. Yeah, Harry Susie going crazy extending that play. It looked like the Jags had him and then he he got the ball off. But. I wonder if that's a situation though, if you're Coach Ortega, you, you hear coaches say all the time, sometimes the best thing is to just eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Throw it away, live another play. Or at that point he could have thrown it out of bounds. Hand off up the middle. Very modest gain on first down. Call it two. Second and eight for the Jags. 106 left to go in the quarter. Got wind blowing things around the press box, Pat. <laughs> Luke Lassick comes to the bottom of your screen. Oh, and this is Busen kill on the keeper. And that would look like an option play there, but uh, very well defended in the middle by Coatesville. Good job by Takaya Lynch, number 43, to jam that one up. It's uh, third and six. Call it. Give a quick shout out, home watching. Three class of 89 Garnet Valley grads and friends. Dana Farrell, Carrie Mink, and Jen Rothfuss, formerly Brady. The Rothfusses are up from Florida visiting for the Thanksgiving holiday, so they're all home watching. Yeah, got a note from uh, Ray Davidson earlier today. He's up in New York on business and probably sitting in a a restaurant with his phone up uh, watching the uh, the game right now. But uh, at the end of the quarter there, we're going to get some score updates from other games with Ben Hoyt. Thank you so much. So Max Busenkel has, not, has no throwing yards on the day, but he has two carries for 10 yards on the day. Checking in with the um, winner of this match will be Bethlehem Freedom and St. Joe's Prep. Last time I checked, St. Joe's Prep had a 10-7 lead. Back to you guys, and it's a very competitive on-the-ground game so far. Thank you, Ben. Another quick shout-out. I got a, a note from our, our good friend General Wiley today, and one of our regular shout-outs is... Uh, gentleman by the name of Stan Solomon who's a roommate of uh, Mr. Wenner, one of our favorite teachers from years gone by, but uh, Stan or Solly as he was known is also friends with our buddy Tom Widely. He's a U.S. Marine Corps veteran of the Vietnam era, was a radio intercept officer and an F-4 fighter during that war. Oh, and here's the reverse pitch out and there's all kinds of green for Westberg. And he's finding his way inside the 10, inside the five. He's still up. Touchdown, Westberg. No. Sorry, folks. They tricked me. They call him down right inside the one-yard line. First and goal for the Jags on the strength. Great blocks by Halloran. Yeah, there, are, there aren't many people in the stadium other than Bessick faster than Jack Westberg, but he did a really nice job there of realizing that he had blockers downfield, and rather than just trying to outrun everybody, he let them get in front of him and get set up. Now the Jags go with their heavy package. And the give goes to Reynolds, and he's in for the touchdown. So the Jags go up 13-7. Just 32 seconds into the second quarter. Pending the extra point here. Yep, this is just off that right side. Good down blocks. And Reynolds just dives in for the, uh, for the score. And this kick is up and it's good. 
So the Jaguars up 14 to seven. We'll dedicate that touchdown to Solly in the uh, the Vietnam era veteran and just thank him for his service and sacrifice and all the all the Vietnam vets and all the vets out there, uh, wheels included and uh, and everyone who, who has served our nation. Uh, we truly appreciate all of our veterans and uh, and their commitment and service to our country. So thanks. That's a uh, a very very nice answer to the uh, to the drive from Coatesville. Yeah, and, and Garner Valley's both of Garner Valley's touchdowns were short, you know, one yard touchdown runs, but both set up by long runs. The long run by Reynolds, and then that one by Westberg on the reverse. Um, and they, you know, make quick work on long drives by the big plays. So now you'll get to see the with the change of the quarter. Now Garnet Valley's kicking with the wind at their back, and I. You see Coatesville's returners <laughs> way up on the 15-yard line. Now they're backing down to the 10, but they certainly are assuming that it's either going to be a touchback or short. I would I would expect to see Libertor try and kick this through the goalpost if he can get it there. And it does. <laughs> line driver that went five deep in the end zone. No doubt about it. Sorry. So now this Jags D has, has the opportunity to with Coatesville having the long 80-yard field having to go into the wind to try and get a stop and get the ball back here now with the one-score lead. Yeah, we see the uh, the Jags, the only passing attempt they had was was that screen pass going into this uh, wind, and we'll see if Susie tries to throw in it. No, he hands off up the middle, but nowhere to go for... Number four, Ashawn Wesley, still manages to pick up uh, about two. Call it second and eight. Conista or Conista, the coach will go in no huddle. Oh, and this is Susie on the delayed draw, and he's up across the forty, across the fifty. Booze and kill chasing. Ball oh, he strips the ball. Oh. oh, and they push it out of bounds smartly. The Susie Boozenkill tracked him down and made a nice play to strip the ball. But Let's see if we do we have that one? You could see Busenkel almost setting that up. You could see he realized he was gaining ground on Susie and just came down with like a tomahawk chop right on top of the ball. Oh, nice pursuit by the Jaguar defense. Tackling Ashawn Wesley for a loss there, second and 11. Big offensive line for for Coatesville. They're huge. <laughs> and this is Susie on the keeper again. And he finds some room up the middle. Just the uh, design delay draw for, uh, for Susie here and is having a lot of success so far early in the game. Third and a long two for the Raiders inside the Garnet Valley 20. Looking to throw this time. Swings it out to the outside. Good enough for the first down. That one complete to Ortega. Six foot, 160 pound senior. Just a quick out in the flat there. Still had to throw a fastball out there to cut through the wind. Susie's got a nice arm on him too. Uh, 
There's an official's timeout. Yeah, it looks like C.J. Wood has to come out to get some medical attention. I don't know whether he's got a cut. The referee was pointing at his elbow. So it just looks like safety C.J. Wood has to come out for a play. You see Trainer working on his arm there. So Westberg goes in, in there as well. Here the give goes to Wesley. And He's caught. with that, C.J. Wood does check right back in. Yeah. And then you see Ryan Saunders hopping off. So Westberg will likely stay in and just switch to the other safety spot. <laughs> so second down and eight. Yeah, that offensive line for, for Coatesville, Ozzie Ortega, 6'1", 280. Jacob Chemilecki, 5'10", 260. Castaneda, 240. Susie rolling out, throwing to the corner. Complete touchdown. Touchdown, Coatesville. Tommy Ortega, just a, an out pattern at the front of the end zone by the, by the marker. Who's in killing coverage, but uh, he cut that one off short and wasn't able to get there. So Coatesville, an extra point away from tying this one up. Kick is up. No good. No good. Well, we talked about having to kick into the wind. <laughs> yeah, that one just a, uh, I guess it went a little wide left. Nolan O'Hara misses that extra point for Coatesville. And the Jags hold a one-point lead with eight minutes and 19 seconds left to go in the first half. And this is something, Pat, that the Garden Valley coaches talked about. I watched it at practice during the week. With Coatesville kicking into this wind, Garnet Valley has their hands return unit, almost their onsides unit, yeah. just expecting some type of ground ball or pop-up. So they put 11 guys on the field that are more natural ball handlers to be prepared for any type of short kick. Yep. Yeah, you can see Matthew Ricky out there, Halloran, Drew Van Horn, the best hands on the team, number 52, Nolan Brennan. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely, a, definitely the hands crew out there. See what... Uh, O'Hara tries to do with this kick. I mean, I can't imagine he's going to try and kick it deep because it won't go anywhere, so. And he doesn't. He kicks the ground ball, and it is covered up by number three, Dozy Acolo. And the Jags will start this drive from their own 35 yard line. Eight minutes and 18 seconds left to go here in the first half. And this is Boozenkill looking to throw the wheel route intended for Westberg. But that one just a little too far for uh, for Westberg. Maybe caught up in that wind a little bit. Didn't uh, didn't take enough off that. <laughs> <laughs> he had him, and yeah. it was there. And Busenkel puts a ball that I think normally was land right on Westberg's hands, but he's throwing right right with that wind dead at his back, going from the <laughs> middle of the field to this sideline, and that ball just took off. Yeah, you wonder if that's even creates more issues than Th than throwing, throwing into, into the Absolutely wind. it does. Oh, there's the pitch out to Reynolds and Reynolds has got some room. He's across the 50 to the 40. Makes a cutback move and now he's got blockers and he's in for a touchdown. In for a touchdown. 65 yard touchdown run for Shane Reynolds. Putting the Jags up 20 He gets to two spectacular blocks right there yep. on the edge. 
And then as he's running downfield, he cuts inside 19 and he gets it from Drew Van Horn. Right there, just enough to keep Bessick off him. That's really well executed by the Jags. Yeah, some great downfield blocking and then also Reynolds being able to use that there, see that it was setting up for him that far downfield and made that cutback. That was, a, that was tremendous. This kick is up and it's good. Three for three. three. For three. And the Jags up 21 to 13 here with eight minutes left to go in the half. So we knew there'd be some big plays in this game, but this is uh, crazy. It is, and Garner Valley, we, we talked, you know, all three scoring drives have had three big runs, two by Reynolds and the one by Westberg. Only difference on that one is that Reynolds took it all the way to the house rather than getting tackled inside the five-yard line. And <laughs> Didn't make them do the extra work. So Liberatore will again try to put this one through the end zone. Quick shout out to two former Jags from the class of 1982, teammates of yours. Dave Mink is watching as well as Kevin Cianci out in Chad's Ford. Mm -hmm. He and his son Brett, a former Unionville Indian football player and Mr. Pick Six previews himself. They're both watching. They checked in saying it was just too cold. <laughs> and this one also six yards deep in the end zone. So Coatesville will start once again at their own 20. I want to thank the Garnet Valley Football Alumni Association for all their work during the, the year. This this likely our uh, the last game we'll be able to uh, to broadcast. Um, the Jags move on. There's others other considerations PIAA does, but. And this give goes to number five, Brian Lacey, but he's met early by the Garnet Valley defense. Ryan Saunders coming out of that pile. Drew Jackalis, number 32, Will Resneski. And that's a no game. Second and 10. Uh, this is a Susie delayed draw again. And it's good for about five that time. Call it third and five for Coatesville. Wonder if they would employ the same strategy as the Jaguars. And, uh, yeah, and this and, would be four right, down And territory. if you're the Jags defense, you're certainly content with, with having Coatesville in third and five all game if you can keep them in that situation. Especially going this way, right to left. Ortega split to the bottom of your screen. Akolo, the cornerback in coverage. And Susie looking to throw, and he does up the middle, but nobody there. Looks like there's a misunderstanding between the patterns that was, should have been run. And it looks quite clear that they're going to go for, go for it on fourth <laughs> and five. Yeah. So fourth down and five, incomplete pass from Susie. Not even sure who that intended receiver would have been. Yeah, I don't know if the uh, the pattern was broken. They're going to have to call timeout. They, they don't know. They have 13 guys on the field. They have nine guys on the field. And there's eight They're gonna seconds have to burn left there. on yeah. the play clock here. Yep, so Coatesville uses their third timeout of the half, so they cannot stop the clock. 6.43 to go in the first half. Jaguars leading 21 to 13. And yeah, you're the Jags. I mean, the the, uh, the big play that's, that's uh, hurt them consistently here has been uh, really been just that uh, quarterback draw 
or maybe too big a cushion. Yeah, it's almost just like there. a delayed inside zone read. I mean, yeah. he, it's almost like he's just reading the gaps, the A and B gaps inside, and then he just picks his spots. Yeah. His eyes never leave the inside, and let's see if they go back to it. Got Drew Van Horn on the far corner. Yep, he's going to look to throw. Oh, and it's going to be a screen pass. Incomplete. And it's incomplete. The Jags are going to take over on downs at the Coatesville 25 yard line. So yeah, I Susie think he has him, but I don't even know deep. if he catches it. If he, There's a Garden Valley defender right on his back. So yeah, I think they were there. Yeah. Even if he catches the ball, I think he was going to be tackled as soon as he caught it. But Jags will take it. Hit that one. So the Jags, first and 10, 6.38 left to go in the half, deep in Coatesville territory. Oh, there's a whistle there. False start. Oh. So the Jaguars I, get called for a false I, start. Can we see a replay? I don't know if we have it queued up. I'm not sure. I wonder if they call this on Westberg, the jet motion. He turns, he wasn't set. That's what they called it on. Oh, Jack okay, Westberg set. wasn't set. He went in yep. motion. If he would have continued in motion, it would be fine. But he turned to get set and then and, and was getting set as they snapped the ball. That's actually going to be on that motion. Yep. Yeah, he needed to stop for... Have to be set for a second. One second. It's called the same play, and it's a keeper for Busenkill, and he gets a couple. Maybe just one there. So second and 14 now for the Jags, but clearly four down territory. Well, they had, they, had Liber they had Libertor kick a 38-yard field goal in a hurricane <laughs> against Lower Marion in Week 10. Say. Or this could be in range with that with that wind. I think he's in range on the GV logo at <laughs> midfield with this wind. And Busenkill looking to the air, and he's got Halloran, and Halloran's bumped, but he stays up. Touchdown, Joe Halloran. Busenkill to Halloran for a 27... They bit. 27-yard Linebackers straight. bite. Yep. They bite, they bite. Great call, well-designed. Halloran found that spot right down the seam. Busenkel that time just floated it up there to give Halloran enough time to run to the ball. Yeah. Number eight, LeBron Bessick, the only one with a chance there, and he tried to put a hit on Halloran, but Halloran kept his balance. Grand, granddad Joe Halloran watching and proud, and as is yeah. Uncle Tom Halloran down in Dunlop, Australia. Good job. Oh, through, off the upright and through. A single doink. You think Libertor called bank? Yeah, that was a uh, the ball was a little high there, and and uh, Brennan did a nice job getting it down. You see Libertor as he comes off the field, or Lib as his boys all call him. Patting himself on the chest like, yeah, that's on me. Yeah, well, you kicked it. It certainly is. Say hi to one of my old neighbors checking in, Ellen Fox. Son played here a few years ago. There were two former Jaguar football alumni, George and Nick Wiesendanger, and current Jaguar Matt Wiesendanger. Um, I got a... A note from Mom Beth asked me to give a shout out to the collective families, the Maronis, Summers, Delmars, and Maddiches. So they are watching from all over the place. So I want to make sure that the Weezen Danger extended crew knows that we thank you for watching. <laughs> Spectacular crowd at the Mo tonight, Pat. Yeah. The hills packed. The both ends of the field are packed. Both sets of bleachers. It's a great atmosphere for high school football. Yeah, I guess we really can't blame those old guys from 82 for sitting yeah, in well. front of a fireplace watching. <laughs> ah, the old wind's blowing the ball off the tee, so Matt yeah. Ricky has to come in and hold it. But, yeah, a great crew here, and Coatesville travels very well as well. The uh, opposite stands 
chock full of Raiders fans. And this one goes deep as well. It looks and like you can, you can Bessix. Yeah, you can see his frustration. He wants to get it. He wants to he's, run it. He's thinking about trying to pull one of those out of the air and run with it. But So the Raiders, with 5.56 to go in the half, have no timeouts, but would like nothing more than to, uh, to get a drive and score before going into the half as they do get the ball back to begin the second half. So naturally the Jaguars looking to make a, a stop here. Try to go in with a, oh, and this will be false start on Coatesville. So it'll be first and 15 now from the Coatesville 15 yard line. Give a shout out previously to Jason Rose out at the Air Force Academy, but just got a request for a shout out to Karen Rose. Sounds like she just finished up dinner at the Chad's Ford Tavern because she mentioned seeing my daughter, who I know is waitressing there right now. <laughs> they moved again. Ooh. Going the wrong way. Yeah. So now. Matt Collins. Hurt. It's going to be first and 20 for Coatesville at their 10-yard line. You could see Susie's frustration on that one. I don't know whether he's trying to get a call with a different cadence. He was really frustrated when that one happened. There was some fast motion going. I don't know if this it was a big play they had planned. He's going up top. And it's intercepted. Intercepted. Oh, it's coming back. They got a block from behind. But Garner Valley still gets the ball. Post possession. And that's it number nine. Max Busenkill. Susie throws a fastball down the middle. Garner Valley, his, after his this gets marked off, there. it'll look at probably Garner Valley's going to have the ball at about the 50. I think they he threw the flag right at there. And I'm sorry, the 45. He threw the flag at the 35-yard line, which is where the block in the back happened. And it was it was close. It was, I don't think, a block that was needed, but a block nonetheless. <laughs> that yeah, no. yeah, but Booz and Kill caught that one uh, in stride. But hey, it's still a turnover for uh, that the Jags will get the ball inside of Coatesville territory at the 45 yard line. See Drew Van Horn in the huddle on offense. It looks like he's in at one of the running back spots. Yeah. See Halloran split. Halloran split wide. Will Rez, tight end split wide. <laughs> yeah, the two tight ends split. Van Horn out in the slot. Westberg in the backfield with Busenkel and Reynolds. And Coatesville not really sure who to cover. Yeah. <laughs> and they can't call timeout. No. They're out of them. And the give goes to Westberg. And he spins for a gain of about three. Call it second and seven for the Jags. And the clock runs now under five minutes and 30 seconds left to go in the half. Will Rez checks out. Luke Lassick checks in. Would think almost certainly four down territory for the Jags here. Yep. And here's another pitch out. Oh, and this is Reynolds, and he breaks through. He's going to score, ladies and gentlemen. 43 yard touchdown run for Shane Reynolds. See, he gets a block on the edge again. They seal. That's Westberg there. It's Westberg. He seals yeah. the edge. He gets that That's edge. the second time just... Jack Westberg's done a really nice job of just planting his feet, standing his ground, and just giving Reynolds an, a lane to run through. He went untouched for 43 yards. So with 4.59 left to go, it's 34 to 13. Let's 
Snap down, hold. Five for five. Kick is good. 35 to 13 with just under five minutes to go in this first half. Jaguars firing on all cylinders here in their running game. And, uh, you know, that doesn't happen. This offensive line has been so fantastic all year. I, I think we say their names quite a bit, but uh, we hadn't done it tonight yet. And center Sam DeTrolio has been a leader out there, the, the smallest of that line, but he, he plays big. Uh, Nolan Brennan, the left tackle. Nick Mahoney, the left guard. Right guard Ben Nash. And Austin Sarakanich, number 62, the right tackle. And, of course, those tight ends, Will Resneski and Joe Halloran doing a lot of blocking. And, and Jack Westberg get, a, get an honorary uh, invitation to the offensive line dinner. <laughs> Pull a quick stat out of, from Ben. Shane Reynolds, so far in this half, 214 yards to go along with his touchdowns. This, Each one's another touchback. Yeah. Okay, give a quick shout out to a big Jag fan. Gray Green, a young Jag. Unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight. Was planning on making the game, but got banged up a little bit late this afternoon and is down at AI getting checked out for some injuries. So he and his dad, Jason, are watching on the phone from... The ER, I believe, down at AI. So do the green men. Feel better, Gray. And this give goes to Wesley. Off the left side, good for a pickup of about seven. Second and three at the 27 yard line. Let's give, oh, this time the keeper goes nowhere as Susie Swallowed up by the middle of the Jaguar defense. Man, he, he did a nice job getting that back to being a no, a no gain. I thought he was tackled two yards in the backfield. He kept his feet and kept his momentum. Now clock running under four minutes. This give is to Wesley, and oh, and he cuts it back, and he's got room. He's across the 50 to the 40, and he's hit. Uh, there's a hold, though. And it's going to come out back. Of bounds. Big it's, hit delivered. They're going to have the first down, and they're going to have the ball at about midfield, but there's a hold on that sideline downfield. Yeah, watch the. He's finally knocked out of bounds by 5'9, 170 pound. That's the hold Wood. right there. Oh, no, sorry. That was Drew Van Horn, number two. So they'll have the ball back just, just shy of their side of the 50-yard line, so right about midfield. It was clearly <laughs> it was clearly a hold. He actually almost grabbed him and threw him off the field. <laughs> I think it was Busenkel downfield getting held out there on the corner. So the, the big gain, still a big gain, still got a first down near the 50-yard line. Three minutes and 40 seconds left to go in the half. Option. And yeah, here's an option. And Susie's on the keeper. And he's got the first down. He's across the 50-yard uh, the line down to the Garnet Valley 41 for the first. As soon as they set this ball, they'll start the clock, and it's running with under three and a half minutes to go. And this one goes to Wesley again, looking for room around oh, the outside. Nice. Oh, great tackle made. Who else? C.J. Wood comes up for the tackle for a loss. 
the first guy got a hand on him. Yeah, but I think just forced him to, to bounce it a little bit wide and gave Wood enough chance to... He does. He forces him a little bit wider and, and gave Wood the opportunity to come up and make the tackle. So that was Will Resneski, number 32, got a hand on him, and then and Wood shot out of a cannon. Got a family shout-out to former Pencrest legend and now Conestoga Athletic Director Kevin Peachin and family watching up there in Conestoga. Susie looking to throw, and he's under pressure. Oh, and they get him almost back to the original line of scrimmage. Third down and 10. They're good pressure by the Jags. Someone was in there early, but Susie made a miss. Got Brennan down there. You got Matt Collins. Here they come again. This one's complete along the sideline, but well short Fourth of the first four. down. Yeah. Fourth and four. Ortega caught that, almost backing up. I don't know whether he was just had to break the route off because of the wind, but he almost kind of stumbles out of bounds. Uh, yeah, pressure was there. He just reacted to the ball. Ryan Saunders on the coverage and the tackle. That's a huge play for both teams here. Yeah, minute 25 left. Coatesville can't stop the clock, but they'd love to get in the end zone. And here's oh. Oh, and a bad pitch. And this ball's on the ground. It goes Doesn't back matter. the yeah. outside of the 45-yard line where the Jags will take over on downs. And now have the ball at midfield. Yep. And I think have all three timeouts, right? Garner Valley hasn't used one, have they? So this is this is Susie, the left-hander, yeah, running to his right, and and uh, we saw that happen to the Jaguars a week or so ago with a with a rough left-handed pitch. Uh, and and <laughs> Coach Ricky talked earlier about the the play at the end of the half last week against Quakertown, the trick play. Right. Well, you want to see Garner Valley obviously try and get the ball downfield and get more points here, but also take care of the ball. Colo to the top of the screen. It's like Lassick and Saunders and the and Jags will use their first timeout. Booze and kill. Yeah, he, he saw, I don't know whether it was the play clock. I didn't see the clock when he called timeout, but there was something he immediately didn't like when yeah. he got to the line of scrimmage. A shout out request to Dave, Peggy, and Katie Haggerty who are watching down in Bethany Beach with their new grandchild, Sebastian. Thanks for tuning in from all the way down there in Bethany. I was just down there today. That's where I spent my Thanksgiving, Pat. <laughs> See, it. not only is our Class 83 Bill Sherman, but his uh, his father and uh, his brother Kyle also tuned in, checking the game. Haven't seen those guys in a while. Bruce Miller and his son Brendan are watching from Palm Springs, California. That must be nice. It's 26 degrees. I'm reading emails and with gloves on and <laughs> oh and this for very little if any gain here second and nine we'll call it so short gain now the clock runs under 59 seconds left to go And a oop, little flare pattern out to Saunders. Get out of bounds. Get out of bounds. And Get he's up bounds. the field. He's across the 40, and he's shoved out of bounds. But they'll stop the clock because he was going forward when he went out of bounds. Look at you knowing the high school rules, Pat. <laughs> I think I heard you say it once, and I'm just <laughs> commandeering it. That was actually a conversation I had with an official late in the season last year <laughs> on the sideline where in almost consecutive plays, the clock stopped on one and didn't on the next, and I was baffled by why and got that explanation. Saunders to the bottom of your screen, Lassick to the top with Westberg. And looks like, oh, West. Eat it. <laughs> yeah. Eat it. Boozenkill looking to throw, but a couple of uh, Coatesville Red Raiders 
all up in there. That was number number three, Chase Scott. Number two, Francisco Hall, applying the pressure to Buzen Kill, and he's wise to just eat it and uh yeah well that's that's kind of what we talked about as they took possession of the ball like you want to try and make something happen but you've got a three scored lead so don't turn the ball over going the other way don't give don't give coatesville an opportunity to make some sort of play in the middle of the field yeah you're up you're up three and then if uh, coatesville comes out in the second half with the possession the last thing you want to do is you know let them bounce back and uh get this close with a with a score late in the, in the half and then an opening drive. So the Jags uh, they, would look. They, they had a game against Downingtown West late in the regular season where they scored, I think, 21 or 22 points in the final four minutes of the game. So they can score quick. They've got the talent to do it. And Busenkill looking to throw. And he's going to step out. He, I don't know if he stepped out before, but he... he just got rid of the football. So it'll be third down. That does stop the clock. Well, yeah. now if you're the Jags, you run the ball. Yeah, I mean, that's been... Or, or you throw a screen or you run draw because you don't want to give Coatesville an opportunity to block a punt. You don't want to put yourself in an in a spot where you have to punt. You run, you run one of your 50-yard running plays that, yeah, well, yeah. that you've had three times tonight. <laughs> Westberg splits wide to the top. Lassick nearest to you on the bottom of your screen. And Boozenkill looking and to throw, but he's a draw is. up the middle. And he's up across the 30. Did he get the first down? He did. Oh, yeah. Or he's just short right of it. Right at the Time line. Out. Now we start doing the uh, doing a little bit of math here, Coach. Yeah, you're you're – Listen, you're in field goal range for Libertor with this wind at his back. Yeah. Now, it's swirling. It's Oh, they're going to kick it. So the ball is at the 28-yard line. This will be a 45-yard attempt. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that was going about his last time out. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't run it down to make it the final play of the half. I thought the, the Busen kill timeout was the first one that, yeah, that I, I remembered. That's what I'm trying to just... Because it's fourth down, they didn't get the first down. Ball is up. And it's good. 45-yard field goal for Zach Libertor to put the Jaguars up 38-13 to with nine seconds left to go in the half. Again, a great job by... Uh, Number 52, Brennan getting the ball down a little bit high. Got it down, but a nice drill. 45-yard <laughs> field goal. Libertor is be pumped good. down there on the sideline, as he <laughs> yes, should be. I don't know. What's, what's the record here? At 46. Valley? Dave Nickel, 46 <laughs> yards. <laughs> I knew that would come right out. So I was almost wondering if Lib was going to take a step back and make sure he got to 46. <laughs> Make it an eight-yard snap instead of seven. <laughs> so that was a huge kick. So he kicked, kicked one in a in a hurricane wind, helping, and uh, one in a in a monsoon a couple weeks back. And you would think that, especially after he's all fired up about his 45-yard field goal, that he's going to blast this through the end zone. Yeah, he's two for two, right? Those are the only two attempts, right? Ah, uh, the ball. Yeah, two for two on field goals. Yeah. 38 yarder into a hurricane. Or no, with a hurricane wind at his back, but with a monsoon rain. Yeah. And now a 45 yarder with the wind at his back. Matt Rickey holding the ball again. And Libertour. Go. Oh. <laughs> He's trying. <laughs> he is. He wants the ball. LeBron He's trying. LeBron Bessick went up to try to high point that one, and, and it went through his hands. So no return. 9.3 seconds left to go in the half. Not sure, you know, Coatesville takes a chance here if they just sit on this. And 
try to go regroup at halftime. Looks like they're going to go in victory formation here and just kneel on this one and call it a call it a half. And that's exactly what they do. So the time will run out on this half with the Jaguars leading 38 to 13. Coatesville will get the ball back. We'll get the ball first to start the second half. Yeah, and that, that field goal is a big play because it makes it actually a four-score game now. Yeah. The 25-point differential. So even three touchdowns and three two-point extra points doesn't get them tied. So they actually need four scores of some sort. Um, I'm going to give a couple quick shout-outs before we put Ben on for some stats and some score updates. We've got Megan Haggerty and Chris Dunn watching. Chris, the spectacular save of the football in the Asa Woman Canal yesterday. I got Morty and Kirk and Fran and crew, the Fitzgibbons and O'Neills and all of them watching in Concord Woods in the Troutman basement. They're all tuning in. I got a quick shout out to Charlie Martarella, who's a football coach watching from up in Levittown. Pat, I don't know if you have any others. No, we got Ben. Huh? Ben, huh? stat man extraordinaire. Ben's on the mic. He's going to give us some updates. So what a spectacular first half for the Garner Valley Jaguars. As I said earlier, Shane Reynolds, 214 rushing yards. He is having himself a game. And some scores from around the PIAA 6A. St. Joe's Prep is now up 17-7, to last reported. And last reported from the Pittsburgh Erie game, McDowell is tied with Mount Lebanon 7-7. to So back to you. Uh, and this has been a spectacular half. Let's see if the Jags can keep it up. All right, thank you, Ben. And yeah, the uh, just a couple others. I got uh, your cousin Hootie is down in CI watching this game. It is palatial estate and uh, checking the action out. Jim Litwa, of course, always watching. And you mentioned Grandpa Joe Halloran. Tim Pulte checking in. Uh, so Jack is back from uh, from Utah at, at uh, Weber State. He was in, saw him yesterday at the uh, practice. And uh, also a mystery person. You have to type in and tell me, but you're there with Eileen, Jason, and Lauren listening and watching from Avalon. So <laughs> Whoever you I'm are. I'm not sure who myself is because I, I have their number, but... Their name's not associated with us, but anyway, thanks for tuning in. Um, have anything else there? Or we can just, uh, we'll take a step step away, uh, catch our breath here, and let's get ready for, uh, for a, another second half of football. Coach Ricky's last day at the Mo, but things keep going the way they're going. Be another uh, exciting round to go next week. So let's uh, take a break, and we'll see you after the half. See you shortly. If you're still tuned in watching at halftime, we apologize. We forgot we had an in-person halftime interview tonight. We are graced with the presence of none other than Robert C. Hayes. Rob Hayes is a classmate and former teammate of mine as a Jaguar, graduated in the class of 88 here at Garnet Valley. Rob is a currently the vice president of the Garnet Valley School Board, a parent of multiple Hayes children who have, some have come through, some currently still in Garnet Valley, and we wanted to give Rob an opportunity to talk about a few things. 
Rob, welcome to the broadcast, buddy. Well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate you guys having me. And, Greg, I wanted to start with uh, stating that both uh, you and Pat were tasked with a uh, an opportunity this summer to replace the legend, the voice of the Valley, Don Mink, and both of you stepped in it to both those roles. Uh, Pat is the play-by-play -play guy, and you was the Keller guy, and there was uh, at no drop-off at all. Um, so kudos to both you and Pat for taking on new roles. Um, I love Don, and I love what he's done in the past, and it's been a seamless transition to you and Pat being the voices of the Valley. Um, we have fun doing it. It's a fun, it's a fun opportunity. We, we do what we can. And I think that's one of the things that's great about our community is uh, I think about when we were young and uh, how much this area has changed, just like the broadcast changed from Don to you and Pat. Um, the people from across Delaware County have moved here, and people across the country and uh, across the globe have moved here. Yeah, we talked about um, <laughs> throughout the season, this being Coach Ricky's last season as a head coach and as a teacher at Carnival Valley. Um, he touched on it briefly in the pregame interview for those that were able to see it. Um, but one of the things that's unique, there, were, with this being win or lose tonight, this was going to be Coach Ricky's last game here at Moda Frank Stadium at the Mo, as it's affectionately known by the community. Um, Garnet Valley, even if they win tonight, will move on to the state semifinals, the Eastern final next week, but that will be at a neutral site. So that game will not be here at the Mo. So this is, in fact, his last game here. There were some emotions this week yesterday with the, the final Thanksgiving practice yesterday morning before the families all went their separate ways for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but one of the things that this opportunity provided was an opportunity for a lot of people to pay homage to Coach Ricky. Um, there, were, there were Facebook posts made today and all week and, and tweets that went out. And class of 91 GV alum Chris Massey is actually a columnist and sports writer at the Sun Gazette up in upstate Pennsylvania in Williamsport. And he is a big Coach Ricky fan. And Coach Ricky, he credits Coach Ricky with getting him where he at, is at in his career as a writer. Uh, having had Coach Ricky as an English teacher. And one of the things that Chris mentioned was when he played in 1991, his team had 29 players. It's a big and difference from <laughs> now, Greg, right? So you look at, you know, and it was grass, and you look at the stadium, you look at the community, you look at the school itself. It's just an entirely different area. And it's one of the things that the players always ask. Like, we hear you guys, you old-timers, which they affectionately call me, talk about what the school was like back then, and there's no way there was only 35 players, and... And then we got, I've brought out programs and had, you know, shown them programs from back then. You know, our senior program, Rob, we only had 13 seniors. Um, and they just can't believe it. They, it. It's tough when, you know, they have 450-some kids per grade here to imagine a high school that only had 100 in the early 90s. And it, it, to your point, it's, it's an entirely different area and community and school district. But the support that Coach Ricky and, and the Garner Valley football program gets from this community is amazing. It truly is. Well, I think when we look back, Greg, to when we were going to school and uh, playing football, how Coach Ricky was, it was kind of uh, new for us. I mean, he took a legendary program that had maybe come across some hard times there a little bit, some challenges, it came in, uh, brought the concept of one this year, developed that, uh, brought our groups together. I think some of my best friends are uh, Garner Valley alumnus, guys that I played football with, and I think his reach goes beyond just the football players. I mean, I... Uh, we'll talk to alumni throughout the community or different parents who have moved here. And uh, Coach Ricky's a, a legend, very similar to uh, the two gentlemen we have in the other room there or uh, the person the stadium's named after. Yeah, absolutely. And, and <laughs> I mentioned the Facebook posts and the, the social media posts this week. A lot of those came from just students of Coach Ricky's, not not. Parents who now have, you know, either either players who once played for him or parents who now have players that play for him currently. But a lot of those posts were from just students that he had in the high school, whether it was English class or high school 101. He influenced so many people in a positive way, not just as a football coach. And he says all the time that football is the least important thing we do. And that that doesn't isn't just for football players. That's for everybody that he teaches and coaches and mentors in the school and he, fox 29 news was here at our thanksgiving day practice yesterday and 
their newscaster, Jen Frederick, was asking him some questions, and, and he took an opportunity to uh, just make some comments along those lines that it's really about making sure that the football players and, and even the managers and the cheerleaders, anybody that's involved in the program, is a good person first and knows how to be a good person, not necessarily a good football player. Um, and that's what really stands out in his legacy is, is that that's what his focus has always been. Well, and the article I read today was by um, Jack Cafferty, who's of the Delaware County Daily Times, who's over there. I don't know if you read that, but it was all about uh, family. And I, I think one of the things that I love about the program and what Coach Ricky's brought to us is, um, you know, he's done what a lot of people have done in this area, which is, you know, we graduated, went to college. For me, I met my wife, came back to the area, raised my family here. You see that with Coach Ricky and his wife, Connie. His father, Len, is in the booth uh, right down the way from us. Um, when, sadly, his mother passed away, uh, I, I went to her funeral, just like Mr. Ricky when he came to my father's funeral, my mother's funeral. He was one of the first people in the line. And I can't say how many times that I've gone to either friends' weddings, funerals, birthdays. I mean, I can't, can't say how many graduation parties he's been to, that I've been to. And if I think about that, and multiply that by 100, I might come close to what that number truly is. I mean, he's um, taken a, a, a non-pedestrian approach to our district and our community and, and really made it his own um, and been a great steward for the program. And um, the other thing I think that we're overlooking a little bit is, although you touched on it, Craig, is what he's done in the classroom and the hallways there and his impact on... Um, various graduates, various students. Um, I'm president of our Rotary Club here, and I know that he'll come to the uh, Student of the Month presentation many times, and uh, not all those kids are football players, and they've been positively impacted by him. Yeah, and it's pretty remarkable. I, having been to a lot of those same graduation parties over the last four or five years with kids of my own who are peers of a lot of those parties that he's popping in at he almost has to set a schedule during that graduation season between you know early may and mid-june with the school as big as it is and as many people as he touches he gets invited to i'm sure hundreds of graduation parties and there are weekends where from almost the morning from 11 a.m until eight o'clock at night he's got a schedule where he bounces from one to the next to the next to the next but he makes them, and he goes, and he makes that a priority um, at a detriment to his own personal timing, you know, his timing on a Saturday or a Sunday where he's using his entire day to do that, but that's just how he feels, and he he frequently gives um, players and and students that he goes to those graduation parties, he gives them a, a letter called The Man in the Glass, and for those who don't know it, I'm not going to read it, but those of us who know it, it's a pretty moving poem, and it's... It's very topical for the way that he has run this Garner Valley football program and has handled himself as a, a coach and teacher over the years. Well, I don't know. I probably wouldn't have the ability to uh, come up with these words here if not having his influence as the English teacher in uh, the, his first day there in ninth grade. And I know that, um, you know, particularly in these last 18 months when we've gone through this pandemic, um, and many of us have felt like we've been knocked to the turf, I know that when I feel that way in my life, I remember my time on the football field and getting hit or broadsided. And what's the first thing we do is we get right back up to our feet. We go back to our huddle and we regroup with our friends. We uh, discuss what the plan is and we move forward in that direction. Yeah, and, you know, it's <laughs> – we have a long half of football left to go here. Mm -hmm. um, but Garnet Valley, as we talked about earlier, lost three consecutive – season-ending games in 2017, 18, and 19 at the hands of these Coatesville Red Raiders um, here in 2017, up there in 2018, and then back down here at the Mo in 2019. So when we saw the bracket laid out and we saw what the potential District 1 championship matchup could be if both teams were able to get here, um, it would be very fitting for Coach Ricky to be able to walk off a victor here. I mean, I'm not trying to get ahead of ourselves, but mm -hmm. it's cer certainly something in the back of everyone's head. Should should the game play out that way, it would be it would be a great send-off for his final moments here at the Mo to be able to walk off District 1 champs and 
go on, but we have we have 24 minutes of football left before we can start thinking about that. Well, it's certainly been an exciting first half, and you know I'm honored, Greg. When I woke up on a Wednesday and Mrs. Hayes said, "Hey, there's an opportunity for a sponsorship. Do you want to be part of that?" Um, I'm honored to be one of the the people to speak at this last game at halftime, and it's at this point I'd like to you know personally thank Mr. Ricky on behalf of my family. Uh, I am the person who I am like so many other because of his influence. And on behalf of the Garner Valley Alumni Association, Dan Foltz president, and alumni everywhere, I'd like to thank Mr. Ricky for his mentorship and friendship and for de developing the concept of oneness that we all embrace. And on behalf of Garner Valley School Board of Directors, Scott Mayer, president, I would like to acknowledge his excellent on the field and in the classroom. Your dedication to our community is exemplary. We wish you much luck in the future and your endeavors of which we know you will succeed. Thank you. Well said. That was spectacular, Rob. That spot on from both representing the board as well as the community. Um, everybody feels that way. And I know there were, if you haven't had a chance, go, go, go look through social media. There were testaments made to Coach Ricky throughout the week, but especially today, the day of the game. Um, so if you haven't had a chance, please go read those because almost every single one I read were spot on, just as your comments were. I, th I do want to point out that Coach Ricky, as much as if he did have an influence on you that you mentioned, he will take no credit for your terrible hands. Well, you know what? Th you know, that's blown up, Greg, because, uh, you know, I know you guys like to have fun with uh, my, my bobble hands, and Pat wants to have a, a, a bobble hands doll giveaway. Um, you know, I, I, you know, one practice I called at least – you know, one catch. Listen, Co Coach Ricky wanted to have us create an award for the bad drop of the week that we were going to hand out, and he was going to name it the Hayes Drop of the Week Award. I, I do have uh, – I'll finish with a funny story. In the summertime, I was working at the Snack Shack for a field hockey game, and there were some bees, and Coach Ricky came driving up. I came out. I said, hey, Coach, I'm thinking about starting a scholarship for football. He's like, what's that about? I go – I'm going to start giving away a, 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 a scholarship for the receiver with the most receptions, like a reception award, and it'll be the Rob Hayes Reception uh, Award. And what will happen is going into the future, people won't know. People won't know about this drop pass thing. They'll only remember that I'm giving the, the, the reception award is named the Rob Hayes Award. Over the course of, you know, 50 years, I'll be known as a great receiver. That'll never happen, Rob. All right. Yeah, uh, you know what? All he did was I, I just heard the uh, the brake release on the golf cart, and he went driving away without <laughs> saying anything. Yeah. Well, sometimes no comment is the best comment, right? Well, as the players return to the field, Greg, I'm going to return the headset to, to Pat. Uh, it's interesting to be on this side of it, um, but uh, I know that you guys are much better at it. So I'll, even Pat Patterson is much better at it than I am. So I'm going to give it back to Pat and his years of experience. All right. Well, what do what do we do to get uh, Greg nominated for sainthood? I think uh, that's our next <laughs> step. After <laughs> it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime learned skill, Pat. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate appreciate Rob coming here, sharing his sentiments about the the history there's and his work with the school board and his dedication, along with the all of the alumni just uh, um, so great to, that so many people stay stay in touch and and uh, appreciate this community like uh, those of us those of us are, that, uh, that that do this all the time are uh, you know, so proud to be a part of. But wanted to mention one thing, Mike Schmidt, who is. Mr. Garnet Valley before there were several Mr. Garnet Valleys, but he, he's at every single game uh, of almost every sport it, that the school has. He sent me a note last week, and I, and I was a little negligent, 
in uh, in getting the shout out to our to our Garnet Valley Middle School heavyweight football team who celebrated an undefeated season this year. So some uh, some talent in the pipeline still coming up, Greg. Yeah, and those grades, you know, Garnet Valley. I don't know if and uh, we mentioned it on the air last week, but Garnet Valley, the the PIAA. Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association that governs high school sports in Pennsylvania. Um, there are six classifications, and Garnet Valley is currently the smallest 6A school from an enrollment standpoint in the state. And as of the October 15th enrollment date guideline, which they use in all the odd years for the following two years, Garnet Valley will now, going forward the next two years, be a 5A school. They're going to go from being the smallest 6A school in the state to one of the larger 5A schools. Um, they're just a few students short of the cutoff. Um, so they're, they'll, they won't see the likes of Coatesville and North Penn and the Chamonix and Quakertown going forward for the next few years. They'll be in that 5A bracket. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it's, it's something to see the success that they've had at this level. Um, you know, the, the article in the paper earlier referenced how back in 2008 when Garner Valley went from a 3A school to a 4A school at the time and jumped into the Central League in 08. There was a lot of chatter about, okay, well, we'll see really how good Garner Valley is now. Now they're in the Central League. Now they're a big school. Mm-hmm. Well, they proceeded to go 10-0 and and win the Central League that first year, and they really haven't looked back. I think this year was their seventh or eighth Central League championship. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. their fourth yeah. straight. Fourth in a so row. <laughs> the, the excitement uh, the from sp- the younger players. The sprint <laughs> down to the sideline for the, for the younger players who – to grab up those uh, those warm jackets and, mu- <laughs> and put them on. There must be a limited number of them because <laughs> it was a mad dash. I thought there must have been like there was a fifty dollar bill in one of them or something that you so get over there and grab a jacket. <laughs> I want to quickly mention this. We talked about the wind in that first half and how much I thought it was going to play into the kicking game. You know, Garner Valley scored most of their points in that second quarter, and you saw all of Libertor's kickoffs going you know six, seven, eight yards deep and and forcing Coatesville to come out. With Coatesville deferring and taking the ball in the second half, Garnet Valley, as as the team kicking off, has the option to choose which end to defend. And Garnet Valley, interestingly here, took that wind in the third yeah. rather than the fourth. So we'll see how that plays out, if at all, down the stretch. So set to go. 24 minutes stand between... The Garnet Valley Jaguars, the Coatesville Red Raiders, and a the District One Six A champion. And just kidding. Zach, <laughs> Zach Libertour has to run by this one because the uh, the wind knocked the, the ball off the tee. Special assistant kickoff holder Matthew Ricky. Chu Ricky's gonna do the duties here. I'm sure Zach Libertour is telling him. Barely hold it. Don't touch it. <laughs> Kickers are picky about how balls get held. And LeBron Bessick down there waiting to try to grab one of these. Nope. <laughs> Reached up he for it, but he keeps trying. Get it. He keeps trying. Saw a couple old timers in the uh, in the booth. Came up to uh, to get warm. Ed Smitherman and uh, Eddie Plasha, who had to remind me that uh, Ed Plasha holds the record for interceptions in a season. No, you're kidding. With he a, mentioned that? He, he mentioned that uh, just three or four times while I saw him there. But Smed had three fumble recoveries in one game, which is also a record. This is Wesley on the carry for Coatesville for a pickup of about two. Second down and eight as this second half gets underway. Jim Gillespie also out there, one of the wide receivers in that era. Not the fleetest of foot. Coatesville going no huddle. And this is Susie just racing to the corner. There's going to be a holding call. As he it's a great job by Ryan Saunders. Defensive coaches tell guys who are getting held, if you're truly getting held, just throw your arms up so that the officials see it. Yeah. So the uh, and is that Susie down on the sideline? 
There's an injured player oh, on the yeah, sideline. I don't yeah. know who. Oh, boy. That would... So the Garner Valley players moving away, giving everybody uh, plenty of room down there. Let's see the... Not sure who the who the backup quarterback would be, but you know, right now thoughts are with Harry Susie, hoping this is uh, nothing serious. It was so, tough to see live because the play happens right at the sideline there, and we're we we as well as the cameras are shielded from the sideline by the. 90 or so Garner Valley players on the side. Well, Susie's up. Yep, he's up on his own, and he's able to to walk off, although it pretty tenderly there as he makes his way uh, to the other sideline. Well, our game sponsors for this night, along with everybody that kicked in last week to help with uh, the 1981 Delval champs and Larry Paolella, Paolella and uh, Sea Devil. The Sea Devil, right? Um, and the uh, the other there's a, the other folks that are slipping my mind. But we also this week the Garner Valley Alumni Association, not to be confused with the football alumni, but the uh, the regular alumni association under the leadership of uh, Dan Foltz and Kevin O'Donohue, uh, they contributed. Rob and Michelle Hayes, of course, you heard from Rob at the half. Uh, the the Hayes family contributed, and then we got a couple of uh, return. Investors uh, Joe Skelly and the Skelly Group and Megan's and David Dodge as well as uh, Tim Martin, the chiropractor. And this is a keeper. Yeah, it's number 11, Amir Haskett, who yep. came in for Susie. Number 11, 5'10", 180-pound sophomore, Amir Haskett. Now the quarterback. He is uh, also the starting cornerback on the defense. This is a tough ask. You <laughs> ask your quarterback to come in, down 25 points, now a third and 17 into a 20-ish mile an hour wind. Yeah. Haskett looking to throw, and he rolls out, trying to keep it alive, and there's a flag in the backfield, which usually means holding. And he runs out of bounds near the original line of scrimmage to make it fourth and ten. But, yep, it's going to go against Coatesville. But the Garner Valley is going to decline. Yep. So it'll be fourth down. Should be fourth down closer to the 20, though, right? I think he looked like, unless he just ran out of bounds way back okay. there. <laughs> yeah, the guy, he's up at the 18, I think, yeah. The guy with the down marker over there. Is that Fran McGraw? I think Fran McGraw's out there. They got a text from Sean, Sean uh, tuning in, and uh, Fran down on the sideline. I know the whole McGraw family's at home celebrating Fran's giving. Yes. And they're going to kick. Oh, and this is a low kick. Nobody back for Garnet Valley. It takes a bit of a Coatesville bounce into Garnet Valley territory, but not too far. Yeah. <laughs> Jags will start at their own 48-yard line. Heard some conversations pregame between a couple of the special teams coaches, and they were discussing just that fact that if, if in fact, Coatesville was punting into the wind, a wind like that can do so much crazy things with the ball, bouncing, coming up way short, you running into people trying to catch it, that they were almost going to not have returners back and just take right. the ball wherever it landed. And it kind of looks like that's how that played out. And they get the ball at, what, the 49-yard line, so. Yep. Pitch out goes to Reynolds. And it's good six. for about six yards. Reynolds with uh, 214 yards in that first half. Some speculation as to whether that's a 
team record. I don't know if there's if they broke it down that far, but anyway, second and four. This one goes to Reynolds as well. He's close to the first down, but it looks like he's going to be about a yard and a half short. So call it third and two, a short two. And I know that the Garner Valley offensive coaches would be perfectly content with the old three, four yards and a cloud of dust on this drive. Oh, go yeah. 49, go 51 yards, eat up clock, and make it a 32-point game. There would be nothing, nothing better for this first possession. Oh, and that oh. give. Let's see where they mark well, it. This side judge closest to us. Looks like it's going to be very close. I think we're going to get our first measurement of the year, Pat? I don't know. Uh, they marked it. Almost oh. a full yard short. Yeah. I would think Garner Valley's going to go. Yep. Definitely. They bring in the two tight ends, Halloran and Resneski. This is a spot Garnet Valley a lot of times will like to run that fake handoff. Oh, and the, the dump to the tight end. Oh, but this one, they give it to the to the Perfect. bell cow, Shane Reynolds, and he picks up two, and he only needed one. Oh, and someone's down holding the knee. Is it? That's Reynolds. That's number six, Reynolds. Previous injury was an ankle, right? Yeah, the one that had him out most of the early part of the season was a right ankle. I don't think that's what he was holding. No, uh, it's he hard went to tell. Right, right at his uh, right D, but he's up. Oh, no, that's Will Rez. So not not Shane Reynolds, but Will Rezneski, but he comes off, and he looks like he's ready to get right back in. But the uh, trainers are going to make sure they talk to him. Uh, Reynolds good enough for the first down, so first and 10 at the Coatesville 40. The clock will wind. Eight minutes and 18 seconds left to go in the third quarter. And this is Busen Kill on the keeper. And he's close to the first down. Going to be second and about one or less. He's got a special request for a shout out from my buddy MVH, Mrs. Van Horn, Michelle Van Horn. <laughs> she wanted to know if I could give a shout out to Graham and Ben up watching Drew. They're up in Warrington, PA, tuning into the stream. So, Graham and Ben, thanks for tuning in. I think Aunt Glennis and Uncle Brian Van Horn are uh, watching at the Concordville Inn this evening. And Boozenkill looking to throw, and he just unloads it down to the sideline. Incomplete. I've said it multiple times during the year. Second one is a prime opportunity to throw the ball. It's You're in two-down territory regardless. You might as well take a shot on second down. If you see somebody open downfield, get the ball in their hands. If not, you've now got two downs to pick up a yard in the case of their situation right now. So they took their shot. Busenkel did the smart thing, didn't take the sack, just threw the ball away. Pitch out to the short side of the field, and this is Reynolds. He's got the first down. And the Jaguars will move the chains. Be first and 10 from the 25. We have a final score in from the other side of this uh, final eight bracket. And uh, St. Joe's Prep has defeated Bethlehem Freedom. 24 to 21 in that game. That kicked off at 6 o'clock tonight. So I was say, what time that they're game? Done, they're, done, <laughs> they're done early. Uh, so the winner of this game will face St. Joe's Prep at a District 1 location to be determined. And Boozenkill looking to throw. He throws it up in the air for Halloran. Touchdown, Garnet Valley. Joe Halloran open in the center of the end zone. Well. We've said it multiple times. Joey Halloran catches everything thrown to him. 
all season. Practice, games, Great. every ball thrown anywhere rem remotely near Joe Haller, and he comes down with it. Great he, protection as well there, he too. He wasn't even a tight end. They moved him to tight end out of a need from a couple different spots. He was a slot box, that same position that Jack Westberg and Sean Gallagher play, and we just had a need at tight end, and Joey moved, and he has had a tremendous season. And this one is good. So it is now 45 to 13. Libertor now six for six and seven for seven, including that 45 yard field goal. 45-13 yep. with 6.54 left to go in the third quarter. And all of Coatesville's points coming in the first quarter of this game, right? Yeah. Now with Harry Susi, apparently out maybe he just got some attention. Maybe he's able to come back. But Coatesville now down Math 32 public. points. Math and public. 32 points. Which would be four possessions, right? Four with two-point conversions. And this one going deep. It's fielded one yard deep in the end zone. He finally yeah. caught it, but. He did. LeBron Bessick wanting to bring that one out. But, trying to sell it. But he can't. So we'll see Coatesville coming out. It's Susie. He's it's back in. Susie. So that's good to see. Yep. He's moving pretty well. Now, if you're the Jags, you talk about game management. Just don't, I'm sure the defensive coach, I'm sure the, the message on the sideline was, just don't give up the big play. Keep everything in front of you if you're a D-back. And this is Susie on the run. Uh, and he's hit, tackled for a loss. As the Jaguars defense turning it up a notch again here. Joe Halloran. So that tackle for a loss, it's second and 11. Play clock under five. I'm not gonna get it off, there's no chance. It's zero. Nope. Delay of game. And there's the delay of game. <laughs> a little bit of communications problems from the sideline. So that moves them back five. It'll be second and 16. Now from the Coatesville 14 yard line. Susie looking to throw. Oh, oh he's under pressure from Collins and Collins it. wraps him up. Matt Collins, number 51 for Garnet Valley. Defensive tackle. 5-7-190. Just split that gap between the 6-1, uh, the 280 pound Ozzy Ortega and got into the backfield as relentless. Big play for Matt Collins. Yeah, he just stayed with it, stayed after him. Ah, oh, this whole hill over here is packed too. Who knew? Third and 22 now for. Timeout. Coatesville. Yep. And Susie will use the first timeout of for Coatesville this half. Down 32, facing a third and 22.
So third and 22 for Coatesville. Trailing by 32 points. See what they have dialed up here. Jaguars with Gallagher, Brennan, Collins. Oh, and here comes pressure. Oh. And he's, oh, safety. and he's going to get a safety here. There's the grounding in the end zone. Number 14, Joe Halloran comes on the blitz. I still don't see a flat. Oh. They're going to say he was at the one foot line? You're kidding me. He was three yards deep in the end zone when he throws he the was. ball. Yeah. He had backed yeah, in. There we go. He had backed had into the end zone. So it's going to be grounding. Safety. Safety. 47 13 and kicking so off to Garner Valley. 47 to 13. And this Garnet Valley team has uh, once again come out of the locker room and, uh, as they usually do, just begun to dominate the line of scrimmage and and they've uh, they've really taken control of this football game and now make it a five score game with yep 5 11 left in the third quarter it's and an if, uphill battle and if they sure. score again we're, yeah. you're looking at a, a potential right and, and not a potential it's a it would be a running clock well we to, talked about that win thing how it played out well you know now now Coatesville's got a kick off from their own 20 yard line or punt they get the free kick Yep. But either way, they're doing it into the wind. Into the wind. So you have to assume Garner Valley is going to get really good field position again. So the Jags, I don't know, you know, maybe uh, the, the strategy of coming out of the locker room and taking the wind was to put that extra pressure on well, offensively. Well, open the game up to a point yeah. where it's out of control, yeah. And the Jags, as they did before, going this way, have that hands team on the field to guard against any kind of squib kick, ground ball. A shout out to Bill Litton and Jen Hewitt watching from their house over off, off of Bethel Road. Said they're all snuggled up tuning into the broadcast. Nolan, oh, no, somebody else kicking. Oh, and that one's fielded by Lassick right at the Coatesville 47 yard line. It's the line drive plucked out of the air. Dave Rez, the, the Linebackers coach who also coaches that kick return unit. I heard him telling his players, all of them, in pregame, if they're kicking that way, all we want is the ball. We don't even care about a return. Just catch the ball. We want the ball. And you see that the message was heard. Yeah, mission accomplished. And, you know, the Jags started to drive in Coatesville territory at the 46. Lassick splits wide to the top. Ooh, this one's Cecchio, and tough run. Good blocking off the right side of the line. Pickup of 11 moves the chains for Garnet Valley. Yep. Joe Hecchio, nice, nice block by Ben Nash. The right guard moves the chains for Garnet Valley. First and 10 at the... Coatesville 34 yard line. This is Booze and Kill. Oh, pitches out to his left. Oh, and it's covered up by Jaguars. Covered up by about four Jaguars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't going to let that one get out of their lair. Um, but yeah, so the Jags, that's that uh, left handed pitch again, just looking uh, for the option over there and just couldn't get a clean pitch. Second and 11 for the Jaguars. This give goes to Saunders. And he gets back across the original line to 
pickup of about two and a half yards. Call it third and eight. Just got a shout out request from Mrs. Coach Ricky. Connie Ricky asked me to give a shout out to their former neighbors. JJ and Annie Jordan now living down in Atlanta, but are tuning in to the broadcast. So Annie and JJ, thanks for watching. Nope. Garnet Valley calls timeout. I want to real quick thank our managerial staff. We've tried to do it every week. I know there are a couple of weeks where the game got away from us late and we didn't have an opportunity to, but Alec Eskin is a senior at Garnet Valley. He is wrapping up his managerial career here with the Jags, but he manages that crew of himself and Ryan Liddy and Nick Baker and Taylor Kratzel and it is a thankless job. They put in many, many hours. They're at the school before practices start, before the players and coaches arrive. They're typically around long after doing some cleanup and getting things ready for the next day. So to those guys, all of them, thank you so much. A shout out to uh, Jason Foltz. A, uh, gosh, he was a 90s era graduate and uh, got a chance to coach him. He's indoctrinating his extended family about the uh, the GV legacy uh, from Modesto, California. Good to hear from you, Jason. Oh! Throw and catch to Indonesio yeah. Colo. He caught it. Got Colo popped when he caught it, but he held catches. on. It's fourth and five. Jeff Seagraves is watching from home. Oh, and that was Pat Bell that was checking in. The mystery man down in Avalon. Booze and kill rolling out. Dumps it off underneath to Halloran. And Halloran shoved out of bounds inside the 15 at about the 13 here. Max Buse and kill does a nice job. It's a little... Uh... Slow rollout. He just waits. He picks his time. He realizes he doesn't have too much pressure coming. Puts it right on the hands of Halloran. You know what that looked like, Greg? That looked like the old waggle. It actually. <laughs> General Widely's brother, Todd, class of 79, checking in from Florida. Booze and kill. Got to get this one off. Give goes inside to Cecchio. And they move the pile for about a pickup of three. Call it second and seven. 2.22 to go in the third quarter. Yeah, the clock's starting to be the, the Red Raiders' biggest enemy here. So yeah. As long as Garda Valley continues to hold this ball, they're, they're just going to run out of time more than the score. It'll be uh, an interesting fourth quarter with Coatesville with the wind running all verticals for 12 minutes. And here's Cecchio. He bounces out, gets the first down, but not the touchdown, so that'll give this clock an opportunity yeah, to run some seconds. more. Yep, and it'll be first and goal at the three-yard line of Coatesville. Freshman football coach and freshman girls basketball coach Dan McManus has a special shout-out that I'll get to right after this play. He asked me to give to a whole crew down in Richmond, Virginia, so hang on for that. <laughs> this give inside. Oh, they blow the whistle, and he's a little bit short. But another 40 seconds will run off. <laughs> yep. So Coach Mack asked me to give a shout-out to all the GV girls currently down in Richmond, Virginia, that play field hockey for Horizon Field Hockey. They're all down in their hotel lobby watching on the TV. And from the reports, <laughs> he said there's multiple siblings of players down here in Richmond with brothers playing. And the lobby is mobbed, and they're all going nuts cheering on the Jags. <laughs> so to all of you from all the way down in Richmond, go Jags. This give goes to Saunders, and he walks in the end zone for another Garnet Valley touchdown. 
right off the left side behind Nolan Brennan and Nick Mahoney. Sam DiTrolio, the center. Cecchio blocking, Will Rez blocking, and the Jags an extra point away from making this a 54 to 13 football game. And there's a flag. Kick is good, but there's, there's no a flag on the play. On extra points. <laughs> What's he calling? A little. I got a request from a kick is good. Whole group of people. Personal foul, roughing the kicker against Coatesville. I didn't see Libertor hit. You can't hit either. the holder either because the holder when he's down is defenseless. So I wonder if one of those guys diving across rolled right. up into Brennan, but I didn't see it. But I have a request, a shout out request from the server staff at the Chad's Ford Tavern who actually have the game on one of the server's phones <laughs> watching the game while they're working. I'm sure their managers are thrilled about nice. that. But they're, they're <laughs> serving dinners to the patrons out there at the Chad's Ford Tavern, but watching the Jags right now up 54 to 13. So to the Chad's Ford Tavern crew, McKenna, Ford, and everyone else out there, thank you. So that was a personal foul on Coatesville there at the on the extra point. And uh, now Libertor will be kicking from the Coatesville 45-yard line as if they needed any assistance to get this ball to the end zone. Ah, oh, he was trying oh. to kick it through the uprights, wasn't he? He was. He's disappointed he didn't do it. So this ball game, even though it is the playoffs, the mercy rule still in effect for PIAA. Jaguars now up by a sufficient number to start that clock. And so yeah, this Jags up 41, so the clock will run the remainder of the game. We'll only stop for timeouts and changes of possession and penalties, I believe, are the three things that cause it to stop. Our halftime guest, Rob Hayes, just forwarded along a shout-out request. Says, hey, Rob, this is Mary Ann. Please tell them that the Chestnuts are cheering from Ocean City, New Jersey, and that Grandpa and Aunt Ellen are also watching from the Concordville and Marist Grove, and that Mary Ann's dad, Grabdoa, Doyo, Gradoyo, is celebrating his 96th birthday tomorrow. Anybody who's turning 96 deserves a shout-out. Absolutely. Happy birthday. That will so do it for the third quarter. So the Coatesville Red Raiders down 41. <laughs> 41 points here going into the fourth quarter. They will get the ball with the wind and will attempt a miraculous comeback. And the Jags will take this uh, tremendous effort that they've given for this three quarters and hold on for another 12 minutes here and uh, we will be crowning a District 1 6A champion here in the, the next 12 minutes and as is our tradition with the, uh, the running clock going, I am going to uh, yield the microphone because I think uh, Ben would throw me out the window if I didn't. Uh, and uh, give our associate producer and uh, chief statistician the headset for this uh, fourth quarter. All right, take it away, Ben. We'll be back for the wrap-up. Thank you so much, Mr. Patterson. As um, was stated, 54-13, 
Garnet Valley over Coatesville. Second and 12 for Coatesville. Three out wide here. Haskett's going to take it himself. Met by Saunders and other defenders, and he is wrapped up good. Short gain there for Haskett. It'll be third down and long from the 19-yard line. I mean, Coach Mink, the Garden Valley Jaguars defense have been absolutely terrific tonight. Buzenkel with two interceptions um, off a very, very dangerous quarterback in Susie. And you can't ask much more from them. Yeah, and we talked about it earlier, Ben. Uh, Susie had some success early on in that first quarter on their touchdown drives, running that little inside zone read where he was just picking the gap and taking off up inside. He hit it for a big gain and then a couple of other seven, eight, nine yard gains. But the Jags defense adjusted to that and really took away that whole inside run game. And, and, and Coach Will really just hasn't had an answer since then. Third and 11. Haskett scrambles, met by Rosniewski. Gets away from him, but has to throw it out of bounds. Incomplete. It'll be fourth down in 11, 10.58 and running. And they let Brandon Bedell in here. <laughs> Where's the bouncer? I don't think that was in the budget, Coach. But 10.45 left to go. 54-13. It looks like Coach will punt. No one back to receive it. Depending on which way the wind is blowing, it is blowing Garnet Valley's direction. And they're going to actually send Ryan Saunders back to receive the kick. Whistles blow. Play stops for a moment, and we're back underway. Let's see if they're 60 yards from the ball. Their coaches told them in pregame that they were going to stand them 60 yards from the ball going this way. Not quite, 55. Punt is up, punt is away. Gets a Coatesville roll. They're not going to touch it. It's going to go all the way to the 20 and beyond. Great punt. will go past the 15 to about the 12. That is a ridiculous punt from Surprised your own. Surprised it didn't roll all the way to the 1, to be honest with you. That was from your own 19-yard line. That's, that's, that's a pretty ridiculous punt there. So Let's on the change of possession, I'll give a couple more quick shout-outs that I'm getting. My buddy MVH also asked me to throw out another request to a big GV fan, Mike Getz. So friend of Michelle Van Horn, Mike Getz, is watching. Also, Jim and Ellen Taviano and family are watching. Former immediate neighbors of the high school, but no longer live in proximity, but they're still tuning in to watch the Jags. So, Tavianos, thanks for watching. Booz and Kel still in the game. Hands off to the first man through. Short gain that time. Be second down. About six or seven. There's a Coatesville player down on the play. So, 9.29 left. The play will stop. Remember, the running clock only stops for injuries and for change of possession. So while um, the injured player is being tended to, I will give a score update, and it's um, to no surprise, Mount Lebanon has been dominating all year. They are winning 40-7 to in their game versus McDowell. They'll move on. Mount Lab, the only other undefeated team. They came into tonight's game also 13-0 and after a big 42-7 to win last week out in the West in their matchup with Pittsburgh Central Catholic. So... They must be a force out there in the western half. And Harrisburg and State College play tomorrow. And that will decide who will play Mount Lebanon for the chance to go to Hershey. However, um, as per results from Cardinal O'Hara, St. Joe's Prep narrowly beat Bethlehem Freedom. They will play the winner of this game, which if, unless Coatesville can make a comeback in the last 9-29, which is unlikely, Garnet Valley will face St. Joe's Prep in the Eastern Regional Final. At a neutral site. So that has yet to be determined. Will probably be announced either tomorrow or Sunday morning. Stay tuned to social media as soon as anybody knows. Athletic Director Seth Bruner will be sure to get it to the coaching staff who will get it out on the... Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, channels, email, so everybody knows where to go and how to watch. 
as Pat mentioned earlier, it's this is likely our last broadcast. There is an outside chance that we have the opportunity to continue our SFBN stream, but it's unlikely. The, the NFHS network has the opportunity to pick up that game and has the rights to stream it. So if they choose to do so, it will be their broadcast, not ours. That is going to be a false start, Garnet Valley. And by the way, um, before I have the uh, forget, because it's on the head right uh, on my mind right now, um, this will, if it is our last broadcast, will most likely be my last football broadcast as I, I am a senior right now. Um, this has been a really fun five years helping with the broadcast, four or five years. Uh, I want to thank so many people, Mr. Bruner, uh, Mr. Mink, the um, Coach Mink, Mr. Patterson, um, of course, my good friend Alec Eskin, and all those along the way to help me with my success on the football broadcast. So hopefully it's not our last, but if it is, a deep thank you to all those involved, and especially you, the viewers. They hand it off to Joe Cecchio. Short gain there on the play. It'll be third down and about nine. I have a shout-out request that I just got, and it's sort of twofold. It's one... I want to give a shout out to Vince Garman. Uh, Vince's mom, Lisa, is the coach of the Garnet Valley Cheer Squad. Um, but I want to take that opportunity to also thank the entire community, the the cheerleaders, Jag Nation, the band, the support that this school has has put behind this program. Not just this year, year in and year out, but certainly this year, it's tremendous. The atmosphere atmosphere here tonight is spectacular. Flag on the play, but a Jaguar is loose. Ronnie Larraris in it, sniffer. But there is a flag on the play right by the night by the uh fifteen Almost. yard line, but always a hold in that spot. And it is. So that'll be taken back. But a great run nevertheless from Ronnie Larraris. Seven twenty eight left to go. The clock will start on the referee's signal. And we'll have third down and a little longer. Take an opportunity. Got some player family shout outs that we always like to get to when we can. Graham and Pop Colston in Glen Mills. Nana Ann Morgan in Lansdale. And Gary Busenkel out in Tempe, Arizona have been watching their guy Max. Sean Gallagher's cousins, Addie, Emmy, and Tenley. And the entire Bourne and Gallagher families up in Nazareth have been watching. Maureen Simkis and Patty B and Aunt Ida in North Wildwood and Aston, respectively, are watching Nolan Brennan. Third down and 14, 708 left to go. And of course, our favorite, CJ Wood. Want to make sure we give a giant shout out. To Peg Leonard, who tunes in week in, week out. The biggest C.J. Wood fan on the planet. She loves Jaguar football. She loves C.J., obviously, and we know she's watching and jumping up and down and cheering. Thank you, Peg. So I want to get a couple shout-outs in on my own. Uh, shout-out to Izzy Braun, who is watching um, our broadcast tonight, and shout-out to Matt Kinzel, also watching his broadcast from home. Thank you so much for tuning in for the last 6.30 left in this game. And Garner Valley, after four attempts, can finally say, up oh, as, as the snap goes into the end zone, that's going to be a safety for Coatesville, and uh, Coatesville will get the ball back. All right, but let's take a look at the replay on that. Airmailed it? Yeah, I think he completely airmailed it. Oh, he was trying to snap it through the uprights, trying to get an extra point. Come on, CJ. So 54-15, 6-19 left to go. But as I was saying, um, before um, the snap went into the end zone, after four attempts, Garnet Valley can finally say they beat Coatesville and achieve the goal of winning the District 1 championship this year, a goal that was set at the start of the season, Coach Mank. Yeah, I mean, Garnet Valley, when they set out, you know, they say, say it week by week. They want to be 1-0, they want to be 2-0, they want to be 3-0. One of the first goals is to win that first one, and then after that they start their sights on the Central League Championship because Central League teams play nine straight league games. So they got to 10-0. and They wanted to secure the one seed, so with some help in that week 10, with some games that played out, they managed to secure that one seed. 
And now, you know, once you make the postseason, the goal, the next big goal becomes the District 1 championship. And this is their first since the 2007 season when they... Ball's loose. Retrieved by Coatesville. 6.17 left to go. Heard a lot of whistles. Did he signal for a fair catch? I didn't see it, but it looked, he must have signaled for a fair catch because as soon as he took possession of the ball, they started blowing whistles. So you can't advance it. But, yeah, Garner Valley back in 2007 when they were a non-league team and still a triple-A school, went on a run, won five straight games on the road in the, in the district and then state playoffs, beat Lampeter Strasburg out at Hershey Stadium in the Eastern Final and then eventually bowed out in a 28-3 defeat against Thomas Jefferson from the Pittsburgh area um, in their only appearance in the state championship game. Um, this will be Garnet Valley's second appearance in the Eastern State Final, the PIAA State Semifinals. Ball's rushed. It's going to be a first down, maybe more, at the 49-yard line. Let's take a look at the replay. Yeah, Haskett gets outside. Picks up good yardage. Clocks will not stop as it's still a running clock. 524 left to go. Ball snapped. Two out wide. They're going to give it to the first man. And tackled right away from at the 35-yard line. 5-10 left to go. I'm going to be hopping off the mic in the final minute of this game or so so that I have an opportunity to get down on the field to congratulate some of the players. But I want to give one last shout-out to Pat Igo. Pat, a former... BYC Bulldog, former GV Jag. He's tuning in from down in Virginia. Oh, hit right away. It was a quarterback sneak, and it was hit by Joe Halloran. Let's take a look at the replay. Yeah, he, he got there in a hurry and got there angry. I mean, right away, the Jags just exploded off the line, and bam. 4.16 uh, left to go, 54-14 from the 38-yard line, third and 12. Haskett in the shotgun. Two men out wide. Snapped. Pressure. Almost tackled. Gallagher chasing after him. They finally get to him. And did he ground that? Brennan got to him, but did he intentionally ground the ball? There was a receiver there. But he's definitely nope. shaking up. They, oh. they, they, they threw the flag. Yeah, they threw the flag. So That's lost it down. It's a turnover. It's going to be Garner Valley ball. So that's, yeah, that is yeah. a loss it down. Garner Valley ball. And Haskett is definitely shaken up on the play. Is that fourth down or third down? I thought that was fourth down. If it was fourth down, it's a turnover on it's, downs. It, lo it looks like it's fourth down and 12 right now. So 3.35 left to go. The clock will run on the ref signal. Oh, they're just going to punt it. As I was mentioning, Pat Igo, former GV player watching from down in Virginia. Pat played at, at BYC in Garner Valley, class of 96. He was also in the Marine Corps. So as Pat mentioned earlier, thank you for your service, Pat. We heard all kinds of good stories from your former coach, Kevin O'D. Punts up, punt is away, and it is very far, and rolls into the end zone. Touchback, 3.15 left to go. I would not expect to see another pass play this game. I would expect the Jags to try to get a couple first downs, run out this clock, and it'll be celebration time from Mo to Frank Stadium. I lied, I have one more shout out. One more. Two more shout-outs. Two more. All right. None other than Vin at Druva. So the Druva, the entire Druva family watching in Bel Air, Maryland. Vinny, one of the best GV alums there is. 
good friend, good friend from high school, good lifelong friend, the entire Druva family watching. And the Nugents, former Garner Valley ice hockey player, Kevin Nugents watching with Fran and, he, and, and mom and dad, Vinny and Diane, former neighbors of mine, they're all watching. Three or three left to go, whistles blow. And it'll be a timeout, Coatesville. I would like to promo something for a minute um, while they're in, in the timeout. So we'll have to see about the football broadcast for next week. But I do know um, our next winter sports broadcast, um, which will feature me and Alec Eskin, who is actually on the field tonight as the head manager. He's been doing a great job. Uh, will be December 10th against Cardinal O'Hara. That is a boys basketball game. Make sure to tune in. It will be a great game. First game in the season. Uh, it will be on the same YouTube channel you are watching tonight, uh, the GV Athletics YouTube channel. So that, and I believe that is a boys game. Unless they scheduled a girls one before that, then we will do, of course, do the girls one before December 10th. But the first uh, known one we have is December 10th versus Cardinal O'Hara. Three minutes left to go. QB keeper, run by Masaros. Good gain, it'll be second down about four. As we tick down here under three minutes, I mentioned I am gonna be stepping off the mic, handing it back over to Pat for final comments, as I'd like to be able to join the team down on the field at the conclusion of the game to congratulate some of the players. I want to take this opportunity personally, if this is indeed our last broadcast, to thank everybody for tuning in. We couldn't do it without the sponsors. We couldn't do it without the viewers. Um, as evidenced by last week, we haven't yet seen the numbers for this week, but at one point last week, I know we had over 17,000 views of the broadcast from last week's Quakertown Round 3 game. I'm hoping it's somewhere around that this week. So to everybody who tunes in, thank you for watching. To everybody who sponsors, thank you. Pat and I really enjoy this. It's fun. It's exciting to watch. It's, it's exciting football to, to, to do play-by-play -play and commentary on. Ben, it was a pleasure having you up here with us and giving us stats and, and having you stand in for us here in the fourth quarter. To everybody out there, make sure you're watching next week, whatever the method is to watch. If you can't get there in person, make sure you tune in. Jags get to move on and play for an Eastern Championship and a and an opportunity to play against St. Joe's Prep for a berth in the state title game. So one last time, go Jags. Go Jags. One last shout out for me. It's my friend Tim's birthday. So happy birthday, Tim. Thank you for watching the broadcast. 126 left to go. Second and one. And the Jags will take it one final time. And then they will get to call themselves district champions. Not the first attempt, not the second attempt, not the third attempt, but the fourth attempt. They finally got the Coatesville Red Raiders. One more knee. And that, you have to take one more. One more knee, one more play, third and two. And this is it. So the Jags have finally got two goals under their belt. Beat Coatesville and are now district champions with one more knee. Maceros takes the knee and that is it from the Mo. Ladies and gentlemen, your Garden Valley Jaguars are 2021 District 1 champions for the 6A level. Your final score here, Garden Valley 54, Coatesville. 15. What a great game, Mr. Patterson. Garnet, yeah, Garnet Valley 54, 54 15. District 1 champions. Couldn't be more proud of this group of players. And, and of course, Coach Ricky, his 260th win of his career uh, brings a District 1 title back to Garnet Valley. And the Jaguars are not done yet, folks. They are. You know, they played a very good football team here tonight. Uh, the number three seed in the region, a very explosive team, a big and talented, well-coached football team. And Garner Valley was really working on all cylinders tonight. And uh, the defense, especially after uh, giving up 
you know, a couple of exchanging drives with Coatesville in the first quarter, the Jags really took control of the football game, uh, both lines of scrimmage, and, and uh, really kept this Coatesville offense in check. So a great game plan, uh, great execution, and a well-deserved, you know, as you said, the fourth time being the charm. This team has uh, sent Garnet Valley home three times in the last four years, and, and uh, this time Garnet Valley gets to move on, and uh, the road doesn't get any easier. They're, uh, Absolutely they not. have a, a semifinal matchup now. They've made the final four of the state semifinal matchup for the Eastern Region against St. Joe's Prep next week. Uh, I'm not sure. It's probably on Friday night. Uh, it will be hosted by District 1, so the neutral site will be within District 1, uh, but that is all we know at this point. So, again, stay tuned for that, and uh, what, a, what a great night. What a great last game for, for Coach Ricky, for all of his players, for all the alumni, and as Greg said, I want to just extend that as well and, and thank Ben for his efforts and the, the – uh, over the years here and, and it's his last broadcast want to thank our crew from sfbn co-producers tonight connor pierce and kevin conley send a shout out to uh to joe magro who has been our producer for the uh the, throughout the whole season just couldn't be here tonight our cameraman our own goody marcusen and sfbn's jack cap and of course uh ben hoyt and his uh, statistics and his call there at the end. I want to thank him for his efforts throughout the years and wish him the best. And want to say thanks to all the fans. It's been a uh, a great ride this year for us. And if we're not able to be with you next week, then uh, let's go Jags. Go Jags. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks everybody for Greg Mink, for the whole crew here. I'm Pat Patterson. Good night, everybody. <laughs>